Without further ado, Madam Executive Director, Ms. Inger Anderson, the floor is yours. Hi, Sammy, I am now in, thank you. Inga, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Excellencies, uh, Ministers. It's a great pleasure to be here today. And I do thank you for finding time in what I know is a very busy schedule to discuss West Asia digital transformation. Excellencies, we are really living in a time of global crisis, a, a crisis that goes far beyond the pandemic. And you as environment ministers see this up front, a crisis that will have longer and wider ranging consequences than COVID-19. And I am, of course, here referring to the crisis of climate change, the crisis of pollution and waste, and the crisis of biodiversity, a crisis that goes to the very heart of your ministries and your mission. This year, we will have seen the impacts of this crisis, these three crises across the globe, most visibly from climate change, which the IPCC recently warned us is intensifying rapidly. And West Asia is facing some of the major, the major brunt of this with the additional risk that uh, this could indeed lead to unlivable conditions for people across the world, including in this region. West Asia can expect a 20% decrease in rainfall over the next 50 years, a huge problem for a region that's already significantly water scarce. According to the World Bank in Jordan, for example, the average per cubic, uh, cubic meter um, freshwater, internal freshwater renewable resource is 70 cubic meters per capita per year. And that includes uh, 700,000 refugees. And we know that a thousand cubic meters per capita per year is already water scarce. And air pollution and dust storms are persistent and growing problems. Almost 90% of the region's waste goes to landfill and urban expansion, and sense of agriculture and the conservation, conservation on marginal lands are all contributing to biodiversity decline. But we should not be full of despair because there are solutions who are at the very core of those. Human technology has played a large part in um, bringing solutions to us. And this is important as we consider that our pollution, fossil fuel, our mechanization, chemicals and pesticides have driven progress, but also the problem. So now we need to turn towards more natural solutions and find our way back to harmony with the planet. Technology has an important place here. It has helped after all, improving the lives of hundreds of millions and, and certainly improved in many, many ways. And if we use technology smartly, it can bring us back from this brink by supporting global and regional processes on the environment. But only if we embrace digital technologies uh, where we work together, work for inclusion, work for poverty reduction, work for transparency, that's when we work for the planet. Excellencies, national and private leaders from West Asia region have committed to reducing emissions and investing in new energy economy. For example, the Saudi Green Initiative aims at 50% renewables in the kingdom's energy mix by 2030, more protected areas and 10 billion new trees. Such commitments can advance and meet, be met through, through digital technologies as advances in artificial intelligence, internet of things, analytics, and cloud computing allows us to back and track 
and change all the time through data-driven decision-making. AI alone has over 80 different applications for the environment. These include transforming traditional sectors and systems to address climate change, protecting biodiversity and bolster human well-being. And meanwhile, cooperation in response to COVID-19 has demonstrated the potential of open science, this unprecedented sharing of ideas and data and facts accelerated by digital technologies. And here, I think it's worthwhile stressing that the West Asia region is increasingly embracing digital transformation for nature positive change and for a nature positive future. For example, the United Arab Emirates has developed a strategy and indeed set up a ministry for AI. Saudi Arabia has established the Data and AI Authority and organized the, Gulf, uh, the Global AI Summit in 2020. Jordan has made enormous stride in building a sophisticated digital infrastructure to accelerate its move towards a digital economy. Bahrain is building a national data lake and the region's first country level data repository covering 73 government entities. Countries across the regions truly are to be congratulated for these efforts. But we all realize we've just begun to tap that potential of the digital technologies. Earlier this month, the United Nations Secretary General outlined a bold vision for our common agenda, articulating how we can move forward to solve the triple planetary crisis using data, using digital technologies, using innovation, and using foresight. So allow me please to suggest some areas of focus that could help accelerate environmental sustainability through digital technologies and the whole of society transformations that are required. And the first one is really that digital technologies can help paint a true picture of the sustainability of our global su supply chains and risks to our economies. As companies develop net zero plans, accurate and real time data sets can allow us to plan and hold each other accountable. Full transparency is necessary and is a precondition for long-term sustainability. And we can here really use digital technologies such as observation and artificial intelligence to generate environmental intelligence about key risks to our economies and to our supply chains. Data and analytics about the state of the environment is impossible to hide or to ignore. And presently, less than 60% of the environmental indicators of the SDGs can be measured globally. So we need to plug this hole through data and through collaboration across the board. My second point is that we can use the digital technologies to align capital, our monies, with sustainability. As digital transformation spreads across all corners of the financial markets, it will be easier and cheaper and more seamless to integrate environmental and climate considerations into costing models, risks assessments, and due diligence. And that will really help the financial sector to step up in the transition to low carbon portfolios and compare the environment, the social, and the governance performance of different companies and sectors. And as investors are looking to where to put their money in future-proof companies, this will drive the investments towards those that have the most sustainable portfolio. And that will obviously also help against greenwashing by bringing transparency, benefiting people, companies, and the planet in the long run. So that would be my second point. My third point is that we can use a digital technology to influence how we, the consumers, make our choices in our cho life choices on consumption to have a positive impact on sustainability. Yes, the government sets the guardrails, the policies, the rules and regulations, and that matters greatly. But at the end of the day, we need to understand that two thirds of emissions are linked to the expenditures and the habits and the way we live in private households. So 2 billion consumers are now on e-commerce platforms. But if we have more information about how our own footprint is and how we can ameliorate and mitigate, we will make different choices. 
and we can be influenced through nudging and other platforms, digital platforms and algorithms to help make sustainability the preferred choice. And my fourth point is that we can use digital technology and digital uh, and AI to really promote inclusion, transparency, equity and equality. Half of the world's population, and most of them women, remain without access to the internet. At least a third of the world's school children are unable to access remote learning during school closures, such as what we have uh, visit, uh, seen through COVID-19. This is obviously unacceptable, and we need to close this gap. We can provide opportunities to many by closing it who lack these opportunities, and also to help educate people how to live in harmony with nature and with the planet. Excellencies, ministers, partners and friends, digitalization is fundamentally changing the world. But this conference shows that the West Asia region is ready, able and driving this change at home, at the regional level and at the global level. This region can now inspire actions and investments that use digital public goods and technologies to advance the climate, the nature, and the pollution goals. You can build partnerships with public and private sectors and actors. And you can look beyond the borders, as many of you are already doing, and regions to get the job done through collaboration and exchange of information. As the UN Secretary General has made very clear, the world needs more and better multilateralism. It needs solidarity. It needs to understand that no community, no country, no region can solve its problems alone. And digital technology has brought us all together, no matter where we are in the world. And it can be a force to create even greater cooperation and to solve the many challenges that we face. But unlike every tool we build, it is wielded and run by us humans and by so, are doing, it is now down to us to use this technology wisely and to create a better future for everyone everywhere. So ministers of environment, excellencies, it is a great pleasure to be with you here today. Your work in this field will have transformational impact and I salute you for that and look forward to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sammy Demasi, and for your introduction, and also, Madam Executive Director, thank you for your intervention uh, and your leadership to bring to reiterate your four points. The, the focus, the focus to bring on real insight to align the money, environment, social, and governance to bring influence on consumption and project inclusivity. I hope that we're able to bring those points uh, during this session. I'll be honored to be your moderator today for this high level panel. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm James Donovan, and I've been involved in the UN system for just over eight years. I've worked with the Global Environmental Outlook as an author for the data and knowledge chapter and I'm delighted to know that digital transformation is in the UNEP's medium term strategy and will enhance data intelligence and also actionable insight for countries. This will allow us to foster a new social contract with all of society and the planet. I'm also proud to be the co-chair of business and industry major group at UNEA and we are happy to hear that this is a new means for the private sector collaboration. As the executive secretary said, two thirds of the equation is the private sector, is set for a collaboration to advance digital transformation, particularly in the West Asia region. Science today tells us the planet is facing these three major crises, climate crisis, nature and biodiversity and pollution crisis. In addition, 
we have received a fundamental warning through this pandemic that we must rethink our relationship with nature and the interventions needed to be done at speed and at scale to deploy solutions where it matters and when it matters. I do have the honor today to being your moderator and I would like to call upon His Excellency, Engineer Mansu al Mushadi, Deputy Minister of Environment, Water and Agriculture from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to address how digital technologies support governments to achieve its goals and national visions. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you, James. Hello and good morning to everyone. Excellencies, distinguished guests, it's a pleasure for me today to participate in the Digital Transformation Conference for the Environment West Asia. I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to the UNEP efforts in setting the agenda and coordinating the meetings and events for this conference. Distinguished guests, the environmental challenges facing the globe have been amplified over the last two decades. Global warming, weather extremes, sea level rise, droughts, and desertification are amongst the biggest global challenges. The weather-related disasters, biodiversity loss, pollution, and climate change resulting from these pressing, pressing challenges need to be addressed with the ambition and urgency. In this regard, we in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia firmly believe that Protecting the environment is one of the pivotal concerns of our time. We are committed to work together to combat climate through collective actions. In line with this, His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, has announced two significant initiatives, the Saudi Green Initiatives and the Middle East Green Initiative, which aim at reducing carbon emissions in the region by 60% and mitigating de deforestation. Under the Saudi Green Initiative, the kingdom plans to plant 10 billion trees over the next decades to raise terrestrial and marine protected area to 30% of the Saudi total area by 2030. And to support a larger reforestation program in the region. This program will be extended to include regional countries and international partners in which 40 billion trees will be planted in the Middle East. Committed to, the, to its responsibility to combating the climate change and supporting the international community in facing the key challenges related to the environment, Saudi Arabia will host the Green Saudi Initiative Forum and the Green Middle East Initiative Summit in October this year. Organizing such event comes within the Saudi framework of determination to establish a lasting global impact, facing climate change, protecting land and nature, and making a strong and effective contribution to achieving global goals. In order to safeguard the planet, environmental issue, where the focus of G20 countries during the G20 Saudi presidency in 2020, the launch of a global coral reef R&D accelerator platform to conserve coral reefs and the global initiative on reducing land degradation and enhancing conservation of terrestrial habitat endorsed by G20 leaders to prevent, halt, and reverse land degradation by 50% in 2040 are innovative action-oriented initiatives. These initiatives are aimed to develop synergies between countries and to foster collaborative efforts addressing global environmental challenges to conserve our marine and terrestrial environment. Distinguished guests, attaining economic growth, social prosperity, and well-being, which cannot be achieved without sustainable environmental stewardship, biodiversity promotion, and prudent management of natural resources. This impact requires concerted effort to promote sustainable consumption and production pattern, reduce waste generation and pollution, 
and increase recycling and reuse of materials. Leveraging technological innovation, sharing knowledge and best practices, building capacity, and facilitating finance are key enablers to attain these objectives. Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030 assigned high priority to environmental protection through national environmental strategy, environmental law, and major restructuring of the environmental sector. The restructuring include creating five national environmental centers, establishing environmental guard, and a national environmental fund to support the financial sustainability of the environmental sector, and to provide incentives for eco-friendly technologies. The national environmental strategy aims to enhance conservation of wildlife and biodiversity strengthen environmental compliance of all sectors and reduce greenhouse gases emission, increase waste recycling, restore vegetation cover, combat desertification, strengthen adaptation and resilience to, com to, to climate change, and maximize NGOs and the private sector participation in environmental conservation and restoration. Distinguished guests, in the context, context of digital transformation, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia maintains an excellent digital infrastructure of, to, to facilitate its digital transformation through building a digital society, a digital economy, and a digital nation. Saudi Arabia has been recently ranked second among the G20 group for its robust digital framework. As digital transformation is a key enabler for realizing Saudi Arabia's vision 2030, several government agencies have developed initiatives and platforms to explore the possibility of the new technologies, as well as how these technologies will impact the future of the digital government, economy, and society in general. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia also published the new national digital transformation strategy and established the Digital Government Authority, DGA, to scale up the efficiency of the government work and adapt the government's digital transformation model to develop a digital and proactive government capable of providing highly efficient digital services and achieving integration in the field of digital government. The DGA is also responsible for issuing indicators, tools, and reports to measure the performance and capabilities of government agencies in the field of e-government and digital governance. Distinguished guests, to conclude, I would like to thank the UNIB for the great effort in organizing this event and providing me with the opportunity to shed some light on how can digital technology support governments to achieve environmental goals and national vision. I believe this conference creates a unique platform for strengthened engagement to discuss global environmental challenges, aligning views and identifying means to strengthen multilateral collaboration to address global environmental challenges and conserve our planet, precious and diverse environmental for future generation. I wish you all a successful event and productive discussions in the upcoming sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, we really appreciate you being able to point out the amplifications of the challenges, uh, the excellent work that Saudi Green Initiative is doing, and in the challenge of bringing and combating climate change and with bringing a focus to marine and terrestrial environment. The government's effort of organizing DGA uh, is obviously taking a leadership position in the region. Thank you. So I would like to now call upon His Excellency uh, Ahmad Hanadeh, which unfortunately was called away on urgent government business. Uh, we do have the honor today to have His Excellency, uh, Dr. Gaza Al-Jabor, who is chairman and CEO of the Technology and Regulatory Commission of Jordan. And 
he will be elaborating what are the enabling conditions for governments to advance digital technologies to forward environmental sustainability. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, Your Excellency. Um, I would start by saying that uh, the UN Climate Change Conference in 2015 stated that the ICT could diminish 20% of CO2 pollution. And I'm going to address some of the technologies that we have and the initiatives we have to move in that direction. Uh, as you know, uh, mobile communications have uh, played a great role in uh, promoting awareness to start with. And there are at least more than 100 mobile communications that people in Jordan use to uh, uh, reduce uh, traffic emissions, improve uh, traffic uh, routing, and reduce time on the roads. Also, we have ITS, uh, Intelligent Transportation Systems, which are uh, dependent in technology. These are achieved, they achieve two purposes, reduce time on the road and reduce, hence reduce emissions. Also, we have uh, cloud computing technologies. Uh, most of the companies we have, uh, our licensees have cloud services. And we uh, say how important that uh, having cloud services, if we did not have cloud services, how many servers would replace the services that cloud service provider uh, you know, offer, offer us? If we uh, have all the servers to uh, achieve and give this service, then we have a great number of uh, servers and hence more emissions and more energy uh, consumptions. And so we, uh, in Jordan, we moved in that direction to have cloud service everywhere, wherever possible, and uh, hence reduce uh, e-waste, reduce uh, emissions and uh, fuel consumption. Uh, also, uh, smart city technologies are uh, used greatly in Jordan. We have uh, technologies like uh, LoRa, like uh, other technologies uh, using mobile services uh, to have, uh, you know, utility services. All these uh, achieve the two goals of uh, emissions uh, reduction and uh, fuel consumptions. So. Uh, also, uh, we can see that uh, we are moving towards capitalizing on AI, as we, I think some of us uh, have seen how AI applications can be used in drones to plant trees and uh, fight deforestation. Uh, so AI is being used in Jordan, and we are building capacity to make sure that AI can predict uh, natural phenomena and uh, you know, improve the data utilization and data analysis, all that uh, will help us to make sure that we have a less negative uh, impact on, uh, on the environment. Also, uh, blockchain has been used and uh, using blockchain in the value chain, you know, the impact and, uh, it will improve efficiencies and reduce emissions and uh, the use of power. Also, we're moving towards 5G. 5G offers us smart city solutions and improve mobility uh, services. Uh, Jordan has uh, moved in the past and uh, making more advances in the uh, paperless environment. We're using less paper, less printers, and uh, we are optimizing uh, businesses so that uh, you know e-waste e -waste is reduced uh, greatly. I believe. Uh, Jordan is capitalizing in technology to make sure that uh, we have environmental sustainability. And uh, Jordan is uh, greatly uh, valued the importance of the environment. And that's why we have a dedicated uh, ministry for the environment, because we value the environment and we want to make sure that sustainability is there. We're moving into a smart agriculture and with the smart agriculture, you know that we uh, conserve water resources and we uh, reduce uh, power consumptions. So I, I believe Jordan is capitalizing the digital technologies to uh, achieve the goals of sustainability and uh, reduce uh, the emissions. 
the planting uh, trees and stuff like this. We have not utilized technology uh, in that direction, but I'm sure that in the future, whatever technology is possible uh, to use in that direction, it will be used. So, uh, as uh, Your Excellency mentioned, Jordan is building a strong uh, uh, digital infrastructure with Alliance to make sure that uh, we reduce e-waste, we reduce uh, fuel consumption. Uh, myself, I would say about, talk about myself and say that my printer at home is becoming a piece of furniture rather than a tool that I use every day to achieve uh, whatever I want to do. Uh, people in Jordan are hungry for technology. They utilize technology to the best they can. And uh, wherever it can be utilized, I, I believe people are utilizing it. And uh, the, the government has many strategies in that direction. And we are all moving uh, uh, towards digital transformation uh, with all its benefits. And one of the most important benefits is uh, environmental sustainability. And um, uh, I know my uh, speech has been more technology biased, but I wanted to uh, demonstrate to you or mention that what technologies are used in Jordan and how they are used. Uh, I believe uh, if we utilize digital technology to its best to conserve the environment, I believe we can. Uh, we can cut the story short and reach uh, most of our goals if uh, people are utilizing it on the individual level and on the state level. Uh, and uh, I would say thank you uh, for giving us the opportunity to participate in this uh, uh, conference. And I believe there are things that can be done uh, regionally where you could use, for example, data centers, uh, you know, move data, data from a country to another and to an neighboring country, but uh, I believe technology in Jordan is given a priority. Uh, His Majesty the King always represses the importance of technology and uh, the utilization of technology to achieve the strategic goals of Jordan. And uh, from my side, thank you. And uh, I've tried to highlight the technologies and the utilization uh, of these technologies in Jordan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, Dr. Al-Jabor, I, I really appreciate uh, you highlighting some of the tangible examples. Uh, I, I think the... You know, how we're all going paperless can really contribute. I think one of the points that you're driving home is also that as we put a value on the environment and be able to build it into our business and our, and our life, we're not only going to reduce costs, but we're going to change our fundamental business model. And I, I really appreciate the steps and the, and the journey that Jordan is taking. So th thank you very much. Thank you. So it, it's, it, I'd, like, I'd like now to give the stage uh, to Her Excellency, uh, Dr. Shaikira Rana uh, bin Iza Al Khalifa, and for her intervention. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Excellencies, distinguished guests, good morning. I would like to begin by thanking His Excellency, the UNEP Regional Director, Mr. Sami. Demasi and the staff at the United Nations Environmental Program Regional Office here at Manama for organizing this exciting conference. I would also like to extend my gratitude to my fellow keynote speakers today for their informative input. As you are all well aware, we are all here today to take part in an event that is meant to explore and enlighten the path towards incorporating the use of digital technologies in our fight against what the UNEP has highlighted as the three foremost environmental crises facing our world today, namely the climate crisis, the biodiversity, and the nature crisis, and the pollution of the water crisis. 
As the Secretary General and Deputy Chairperson of the Kingdom of Bahrain's Higher Educational Council, I would like to comment first more broadly on the environmental agenda and the accomplishments of my country's governments before elaborating on how I believe higher education can better serve this conference's stated goal of involving digital technologies in sustainable development policies and environmental governance. The Kingdom of Bahrain is committed to protecting the environment and preserving natural resource, resources while pursuing its ambitious national developmental agenda. The, government's gover the Kingdom's government has made significant progress in these areas incorporating the Sustainable Development Goals 2030 set by the United Nations General Assembly into its Government Action Plan and Economic Vision 2030. In fact, the sustainability is one of the three principles guiding Bahrain's Economic Vision 2030. As many an environmentally sensitive matter form a core focus of this program, including the environment more broadly. Sustainable resource management, urban development matters pertaining to water and energy, transport, urban growth, water management, marine conservation, and biodiversity, among other issues. Moreover, the kingdom has implemented a range of initiatives to support the protection and, preserv and preservation of the environment. These include the following. The Bahrain National Environment Strategy, Climate Action in Bahrain, Pursuing the Sustainable Development Goals 2030, Inaugurating a Supreme Council for the Environment, Progress in the Areas of Sustainable Development to Protect the Environment and National Resources, Recognizing Award-Winning Efforts, Several Environment Protection Degrees and Decisions, Various Conferences and Agreements, the hosting of the regional United Nations Environment Program, UN Environment, the NSSA, the Kingdom of Bahrain Space Vision and Mission. As I have given you all an overview of all that has been done by my country's government in pursuit of sustainability and protecting the environment, I feel as though it is now possible to begin speaking about how, these, how this issue factors into higher education scene in the Kingdom of Bahrain. As it currently stands, there are several postgraduate programs offered by the institutions of higher education in the environment fields in the kingdom. These include, but are not limited to the following subjects, environmental biotechnology, environmental sciences and natural, natural resources, water resource management, uh, agricultural biotechnology, and hydrogeology. It is my firm belief that digitalization has served and continues to serve the higher education scene, not only here in the kingdom, but in the whole world for better. This past year and a half, for instance, we all bore witness to how distance learning technologies have helped preempt the potential distribution of teaching that is ongoing on this, and that is this ongoing pandemic, <coughs> that this ongoing pandemic may have provoked only a few, a few years ago. I can confidently attest on how digital transformation has helped better serve higher education institutions to conduct science-based analysis of environment trends in the Kingdom of Bahrain. This is not least because of the role of higher education institutions in relations to environment sustainability has historically been more prevalent universities are. Universities are of course the apex body in any higher education ecosystem and are therefore best equipped to provide environmental education through their curriculum design, research and collaborative efforts with the NGOs working in those areas. They can also more generally provide trained manpower and knowledgeable expertise to solve uh, critical environmental problems to governmental and international agencies, as well as companies in the private sector. They also tend to act on a more fundamental level 
as a good networking systems and platforms for data collection. On that note, I would like to uh, refer to the data surrounding publications on digi digitalization and sustainability. According to the Scopus Academic Database, the number of articles on the subject of sustainable management of digital transformation in higher education between the years 1986 and 2019 has only grown exp exponentially in 1986, only two articles were published on this topic. Whereas by the year 2019, that number grew to 248 related articles being published in a single year. Moreover, in that year alone, out of all of the 1,590 articles published on the platform, the second highest area was in the environmental sciences category which accounted for approximately 16.6% of all articles published on the database for that year. This information all points out to the increasing popularity that environmental studies and sustainability have gained in the realm of academia over the last few decades. With the outbreak of COVID-19, Many types of additional environmental challenges have arisen, such as exposure to disinfectants, increased production of solid waste, reduced recycling, increased use of biomass, food insecurity, and the unfortunate halting of the renewable energy-related projects and initiatives. These developments have in turn spurred researchers into suggesting and stressing the need to learn from the spillover of the pandemic to ensure sustainable city planning and management in the event of future crises. Doubling down on the digitalization of the higher education scene can no doubt aid in these efforts. There is an old Native American saying that warns that, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors we borrow it for our children. As we edge closer to the first quarter of the 21st century, may we bear these words in mind and know that it is also our duty to teach, equip, and ultimately prepare future generations with the knowledge necessary for them to become responsible custodians of our planet. That in turn can best be done by better integrating sustainability, geared mindset into academia and higher education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Dr. Al-Khalifa, this is, uh, you know, I, I can't support enough how, how much uh, education has a fundamental role in changing society's behavior. And I, I'd like to, first of all, th thank, you know, yourself and the government of Bahrain uh, for its leadership in, in taking 2030 uh, SDG goals and building it into your national plan. Uh, the emphasis on education through environment, biotech, environmental sciences, water sciences uh, is admirable. I think one of the points that you bring up that really needs focus is the spillover effect that is being brought about by the pandemic. Uh, how, do, how do we build in more resiliency? Because it, it appears that we're in for more uh, disruption as, as we go forward. So just to, just to round out, I, I think that with the enabling policy implementation and incentive and educating society at large, I believe we'll have a better chance to address the climate emergency and other externalities, uh, such as the spillover effects that threaten our planet and near existence. So we're currently receiving a lot of questions uh, from our audience, and I would like to open up the floor for a Q&A portion. Anyone on our panel can use the raise hand function if you'd like to answer a specific question. And if possible, I'd like to uh, op open up the questions uh, with the first one. How do we effectively engage the private sector and develop a digital transformation roadmap in the region? Anyone from our panel, please?
Well, maybe Jamie will allow me to go. I will not speak Please. to the region, but I will speak to the global experience. And I'm sure Excellence is present here. We wish to speak to the region. But I think it, first of all, we're very much on the road towards that. It begins by having the basic infrastructure, right? I mean, if you don't, if you don't, if you're not digitally connected, if you don't have the actual infrastructure, it becomes very difficult. And this is where the countries that we are in, whose presence we are today, are making some real strides. And we heard from the three interventions exactly that. But the second thing is, of course, to construct the very platforms on which. Uh, that kind of exchange can be enabled. And we've seen interesting uh, ex uh, experiments, if you like, in the broader environmental setting across the world, including where uh, citizens can upload um, uh, pollution measures that they may have in their neighborhood, and this can be crowdsourced by the ministries uh, or by others uh, to understand pollution loads, including um, um, obviously data that is available from a variety of ministries, um, and be it agriculture, be it trade, et cetera, that, that can be brought together by the government hand to enable citizens to better understand the realities and make uh, their choices. And including obviously for businesses to do two things, on the one hand, receiving information, but on the other hand, giving information. If you have a business that has a, a toxic trail or pollution load, uh, government uh, and that business will be in a regulatory uh, framework with pertaining to that. The business has an obligation on the, in most uh, jurisdictions to um, deliver to the government and to live within the certain guidelines of that uh, footprint. Um, it's very helpful uh, if, uh, if it's uploadable uh, and accessible to uh, the, the broader media uh, and the broader public, uh, public so that there is transparency and trust in the system. I think that um, the more we have the enablement through portals and through systems that we are hearing from this region are being built, the better the overall systems uh, will be on the environmental management front. Thank you. Inger, uh, th thank you very much. I, I'd, I'd like to just uh, take that point just a little bit uh, further because I think some of the points that was brought up from His Excellency from Jordan, uh, Dr. Al Jabour of the tangible effects, the value that can be brought by digital transformation. But I think you bring up another point, sort of the part two, how, does, how do we gain trust how do we? How does society, governments, uh, private sector use digital transformation to build in trust in this journey to this new business model where we have to value environment, we have to value and build in sustainable ESG will become part of a value proposition as we go through that journey. I think that second part that you pointed out, the trust, the digital transformation, and and the fact that maybe you know different different contributors such as citizen science or uh, other contributors along the journey that can populate digital transformation can help build that trust. Uh, other questions, I, I know we're running uh, short on time, so, but uh, any, any other contributions? All right. I, I, do, I do apologize. I'm sorry, Jim, you had Dr. Al Jabour. Please, um, he oh, was yes. putting up his hand. Yes. Oh, please. Dr. Jabour. The floor is yours, Your Excellency. Dr. Jabour, you need to unmute kindly. What, what is it you want me to talk about? Hello. Uh, Dr. Jabour, I, I, we, we think that there was a question uh, that you were, you were trying to contribute to. I don't have any questions. You know. Thank you very much. Thank I don't have any questions. All right. Thank, thank you. We, we, do, we do have a lot of questions uh, coming in, but uh, we are unfortunately running out of time. Uh, we do have a team who are recording the questions and uh, will be given to our panelists and we will definitely uh, get them posted back. Uh, we still have an exciting session ahead and I would like to thank 
each and every one of our panelists for joining the high level session. It is clear that the collective action is crucial to the successful implementation of digital transformation, not only in West Asia, but for the globe. We need to galvanize the concerted action coming from the organizations like UNEP, where the support for digital transformation is reflected in their medium term strategy and other programs like the Global Environmental Outlook. We also need the political will from the governments as manifested by the points made by our excellencies from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Jordan, and the education that was represented by our excellency from Bahrain in integrating sustainability mindset and education, especially in our, especially in our use. There is no one formula or silver bullet in bringing environmental sustainability in the needed speed and scale and impact, but through mutual trust from all actors, including private sector society and government, the achievement of the 2030 agenda will be made possible. Thank you today for all the excellencies and ministers and distinguished panelists and to our audience tuned in from all over the world. We'll be back after a 10 minute break. Please stay tuned for the next session of the digital transformation in West Asia. And thank you all again. Thank you. Hi, Jim. Can I do a quick mic test? Test, test. Very clear. Can you hear me? Test one. Test, test. Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, Jim, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect, thanks.
Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're starting the next session for this conference. Um, I, I believe we have our panelists who has already joined us um, in the conference. So uh, allow me to start off by greeting everyone. Good afternoon. And to those who are tuned in from different time zones, good morning and good evening. Um, allow me to introduce myself first. I am Michelle Tan from Global CEO Alliance, and I will be your moderator for this segment. I have the pleasure of welcoming you all to our second session, Digital Transformation in West Asia. And uh, let me start off by giving some introductions to our esteemed panelists for today. Um, Mr. David Jensen, coordinator of UNEP Digital Transformation Task Force. We also have Mr. Abdelmenem Mohammed, UNEP's regional coordinator for science in West Asia, followed by engineer Bayan Mahmoud Atamne, manager of soil quality environment agency Abu Dhabi. And uh, also last but not least, um, we also have a message from Ms. Barbara Henry, director of UNEP North America. So without further ado, let's start off with a presentation of Mr. David Jensen. David, over to you. Thank you so much, colleagues. It's a true pleasure to be here. Let me share my screen and I'll start. Okay, is my screen up and running now? Yes, perfect. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna provide a, a very short overview in terms of this relationship between digital transformation and environmental sustainability and try to answer the question, what's really at stake? So we're gonna start at that global level, right? Looking at these two core trends that are sweeping the planet. As Inger already mentioned, we have this triple planetary crisis where our life support system is in peril. And at the same time, we have digital transformation transforming our products, our services, our sectors, and our systems. And the real question is, what is the relationship between these two megatrends and can that relationship be directed? And if you talk to the Secretary General, he now believes answering these questions is one of the most pressing problems facing humanity today. So let's unpack this a little bit more. Now, if you look at the triple planetary crises and all of the reports uh, coming out from different scientific communities, everybody will see that there's a unanimous consensus and we have less than 10 years to solve these three issues, while at the same time also achieving the SDGs. So the clock is ticking and there isn't a huge amount of time left. 
But the question is, what kind of feasibility uh, do we actually face in achieving those goals in 10 years? And if we look back at our track record at the global level, we have to accept that we haven't really been able to bend the curve downwards for any of these planetary crises since in the last 50 years, right? If you look at climate uh, CO2 emissions, are we achieving climate stability? No. If you look at our work in, in nature, you know, are we living in harmony with nature? No. Have we achieved major inroads into a pollution-free planet? The answer is no. Now, if you look at our solutions, global environmental governance frameworks, we have to start accepting that they may actually not be fit for purpose. We have signed around 500 agreements in the last 50 years. And if you actually look at progress made, we've really only made significant progress in about four of the 90 targets. We're also looking at you know, our track record and accelerating progress on the, the environmental indicators of the SDG. And this is also facing significant barriers. You will know that there are 92 indicators on environment within the SDG framework. Now we've made positive progress on 28%, um, but we're not even tracking progress for 58% of them. As Inger mentioned, we don't even have global data to know if we're on track or not for almost 60% of these indicators. So I think the conclusion that we can make at the moment, and this is unfortunate, but business as usual is just not working to tackle these planetary crises. And it's not working because at the fundamental level, it's not changing the underlying systems, the incentives and the behaviors at the speed and scale that we need. So that's kind of the first key message and conclusion. And that's kind of depressing, frankly, that's not very hopeful, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel and that is digital technology, right? Digital technologies are offering this ray of hope because they're now disrupting and transforming every aspect of our lives and all of the operating systems that influence our behaviors. Now, what do I mean by operating systems? Human cognition, for example, the operating system in our minds, right? Artificial intelligence, cloud computing, is fundamentally augmenting these capacities. We're out now on our mobile phones three to four hours a day minimum, and there's a supercomputer you know, being pointed at our brains every single day trying to influence and manipulate us. And this is fundamentally disrupting our cognitive system. Our social systems, right? Social media are now connecting 4 billion people. Phenomenal amount of ideas are being exchanged and moving around the planet at the speed of light. And this is fundamentally upending uh, many of our social systems and, and even our cultures and our social relationships. Our economic system completely undergoing transformation. Platforms and blockchain and all kinds of digital tech are now leading to a situation where around 60% of the economy will be digitalized by the end of 2023. Our technology systems, right? We're moving towards smart technologies. We're moving towards the internet of things. At the moment, we have 21.5 billion devices interconnected and intercommunicating with each other. And finally, our governance systems are being upended, whether it's for procurement or whether it's cryptocurrency or identities. Uh, there's serious disruption happening to our governance systems. Um, and if we could only channel uh, government procurement, uh, we could actually influence around 20% of, of global GDP. So all of these systems are being transformed and disrupted. And what I find really exciting about this um, is that each individual system is also now being interconnected, right? So they're being interconnected into this planetary scale digital ecosystem. And that alone could be, could be transformative. So here's kind of, you know, again, message number two. There are this range of digital technologies now, and I won't go through all of them. You all know what these are. They've been mentioned already. These are now being combined uh, to really accelerate uh, environmental sustainability. And I think there are these two levels we have to be thinking about. So level one is really how do these technologies start to change product and services in the economy and make those products and services uh, more environmentally sustainable. And I would say, you know, these are the kind of uh, digital transformation outcomes that a lot of people are thinking about. How do we make those products and services more efficient? How do we substitute one product for another or, or move between sort of atoms and bits? How do we improve coordination of supply chains? And how do we make supply chains more transparent? So that's kind of level one digital transformation. And I'm gonna call that 
kind of the easy level of digital transformation, okay? But that's really important foundational transformation of our products and services. But the, the level I wanna talk about is really level two, and that's digital transformation of entire sectors and entire systems using these technologies. And in this kind of level two, we need to be looking at, you know, how do we improve human agency to adopt sustainable behaviors? What kind of digital incentives can we, can we put into the economy to, to, again, align our behaviors uh, with sustainability? How do we create feedback loops to reinforce the kind of behaviors we want to see? And how do we build trust between all of these actors? So I think as we go forward, we should be thinking about these kind of two levels, the, the easier level and then level two, which I think is the harder level, because that's really looking at some sort of sectoral and system level transformation. Now, here is the third message, and that is if we fail to act, if we fail to direct digital transformation towards environmentally sustainable outcomes, um, it will simply, you know, digital transformation will further accelerate business as usual and the pursuit of profit over people and planet. That is crystal, crystal clear. And in fact, digital transformation, uh, which is not directed, or business as usual digital transformation will actually augment a, a number of you know, serious risks to sustainability. It will drive hyperconsumption. It will continue to propel misinformation. It'll continue to polarize different perspectives. It'll lead to a series of e-waste impacts or impacts from e-waste, and it'll obviously increase energy demand. So we need to be thinking about you know, engaging now in order to mitigate these kind of risks. So the SG, you'll see the SG will say, we're now standing at this pivotal moment in human history in terms of how each of our operating systems is digitally transformed. The digital revolution could be the single largest opportunity to achieve system level changes aligned to the SDGs. You know, it could be that silver bullet, um, but it also could be the largest risk to entrench business as usual and accelerate the death of our planet. And we have to decide which of these two paths we now take. So. Uh, final message, and that is um, really to accelerate this kind of system level transformation for environmental sustainability. We believe that there must be collaboration, coordination uh, between public and private sectors in five core missions over the next two years. So what are these five core missions? Well, first and foremost, we need a planetary operating system and a planetary scale dashboard. So fundamentally, regulators need to be adopting regulations, policies, and standards that will enable a digital circular economy and a real-time planetary dashboard so we can understand and have full transparency over our natural resources, over the risks, and how these resources are being used. Second, we need full supply chain transparency. Producers and companies must start to systematically measure and value and disclose uh, environment and carbon performance, uh, of their value chains and supply chains. The third mission, sustainability by default, right? Platforms have to start using algorithms and filters to recommend and promote sustainable products and services by default, right? That has to become part of the code of our platforms. They need to be helping us select the products and services that are more sustainable than others. Procurement with purpose, right? Consumers, buyers, we need access to information and incentives that help nudge us towards those sustainable products, services, and behaviors. And finally, we ultimately have to align our capital with our climate aspirations, using environmental data to really drive uh, environment, social, and governance, investing, and risk analysis. And these are the five uh, core missions that UNEP's Digital Transformation Program hopes to enable and empower. The one thing I will leave you with uh, in terms of immediate uh, steps to talk about is this transformative concept called the digital product passport. This is kind of one of those core foundational investments that would actually bring those five core missions together. And so basically the idea is, is fairly simple. As we move into a circular economy, every product will have a life cycle loop and it'll have a data loop, right? And we need to start structuring what that data loop looks like um, and how can we have sort of a data pod that is attached to every product and every service in the economy, where we can begin to look at the providence of that product, the supply chain, the, the environmental impact, the carbon impact, the recycling pathways, all this data can be stored in this digital product passport for different actors to, 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 to access. 
Um, so that's what we're looking to build going forward is this digital product passport. And we need to start having a dialogue in terms of how to shape uh, this, this, uh, this investment. So as Inger mentioned, um, as all human transactions are increasingly digitalized, the big vision is that we must integrate environmental sustainability metrics, values, and outcomes into the algorithms and the codes of the digital economy. Digital transformation must make sustainability simple, seamless, and scalable by default. And that is the goal we want to achieve. Final slide, what are we doing in the short term uh, or the next couple of years uh, to take this forward? The first pillar of our work is looking at the foundational data and the digital infrastructure needed. Um, Inger mentioned starting with plugging those environmental SDG data gaps, looking at non-traditional sources of data that's either uh, from big data and earth observation and sensors or from crowdsourcing. We're building a world environment situation room to aggregate all of this data and make it available. Um, we're, we're developing a global environmental data strategy between public, private sectors and civil society, looking at building API for Earth standards, and then really helping to identify what is the high value public data needed by UN country teams and private sector actors to accelerate their SDG goals. The second area is looking at catalytic digital transformation partnerships. Um, we're going to talk about one of these partnerships tomorrow, but it's the Coalition for Digital Environmental Sustainability. This is CODES, and this is part of the Secretary General's Digital Cooperation Roadmap. This is looking all about, you know, how do we start to accelerate uh, environmental sustainability with digital technologies, and what are the specific investments that public and private actors need to make? We're looking at this digital product passport, and ultimately, we're trying to start to orient all of our flagship product services and partnerships towards this idea of a moonshot uh, and system level transformation. And then finally, we're looking at uh, digital literacy and engagement of stakeholders, starting to develop e-learning programs on how do you, you, know, how do you use uh, uh, digital, and, uh, digital tools for environmental sustainability. We're offering monthly webinars called digital discovery sessions. We're starting to support more systematically hackathons and open innovation on green digital technologies. And finally, we're working on various technical reports looking at this intersection between digital transformation and environmental sustainability. So that is the context uh, that we face and those are some of the actions that UNEP is undertaking. I thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, David, for your presentation. And uh, thank you for highlighting the potential of uh, digital technologies in solving or influencing the environmental dimension of the ESG, um, particular, uh, the ESG um, particularly the sectoral transformation and also the critical role for, of both uh, public and the private sector. Um, we are also receiving quite a number of questions from our audience, but uh, we'll get back to that in our Q&A se session in the latter part of the segment. So please keep sending your question in the Q&A button at the button, bottom of your screen. Um, if we don't have enough time to address each one of them, we'll get back to you via email. Um, for the meantime, um, may we now proceed with Mr. Abdelmena Mohamed for a deep dive on West Asia perspective on digital transformation. The floor is yours, Abdelmena. Thank you, thank you, Michelle, and uh, hello, everyone. My name is Abdelmena Mohammed. I am the Regional Coordinator for Science in UNEP West Asia office in Bahrain. And uh, thank you for, for being with us today. Um, I would like also to thank David for laying the ground and uh, explaining how uh, UNEP uh, vision is about uh, digital transformation. So this will help me to connect the dots when it comes to the region. So. Without further ado, let me share my screen. Michelle, please confirm when you see my screen. Yes. You can see it? Yep, thank okay. you. Okay, all right, very good. So, So today I will, I will talk about uh, two parts. One is the key environmental challenges in, uh, in West Asia region. And the second part, I will also talk about opportunity for digital transformation in, in the region. So before we start, maybe we have a look about the geographical coverage of West Asia. Uh, as you can see, uh, we are covering 12 countries 
the GCC countries, the, the six uh, country from the GCC Council, plus Yemen and the Mashhad countries. Uh, so these are the countries that are uh, covered by the regional office in West Asia. So talking about the environmental priorities, and uh, as you know, UNEP is a, a science-based organization. So we build all our, uh, let's say, messages and statement on science. And for that, for the region, uh, we uh, recently uh, developed or produced a regional assessment for the environmental, for the environment and the outlook in the region in West Asia. And it, it was a very comprehensive exercise consultation with stakeholders, with government, with scientists, uh, civil societies. Everybody was involved in this uh, report, which is available online in both languages, Arabic and English. And during this journey, we have identified 12 environmental priorities for West Asia's uh, region. And as you can see here in these circles, and uh, there are two uh, priority area. The, the first one, which is peace, security, and environment. This is the most, um, uh, let's say, on the top agenda for the region as a, as a, a top priority. And the, uh, another priority, which is in the bottom, which is cross-cutting related to environmental governance and regional and inter international uh, cooperation. So these are the, the, let's say the, uh, the cross-cutting uh, areas that are uh, at a priority for the region. The other uh, priority areas from the 12, seven, as you can see, the green, I you know, classified them in green because these are related to the nature pillar of our uh, medium-term strategy. So these, the green, uh, they are related to nature. So desertification, marine and coastal management, biodiversity, freshwater resources, sustainable use uh, of natural resources, urbanization, land use planning, and integrated waste management. So all, all, all of these, they are more or less related to, to nature and affecting the, the nature. Two uh, priority areas related to climate, climate change. One is climate change adaptation and mitigation. The other one is related to energy mix and uh, diversification and access. And the, the, the one that in, in the right side um, in gray is related to pollution, as you can see environment and its impact on public health, uh, which is more or less related to uh, uh, pollution. So these are the main uh, regional priorities uh, for the region uh, based on the, the regional report that was, uh, as I mentioned, uh, produced uh, by the regional office. So just to get some ideas about these priorities for, uh, for climate change, uh, as you can see, the, the climate models, they are showing that next uh, 50 years in West Asia, there will be increased 20% in uh, rainfall, uh, increase in uh, temperature, evaporation, all these that are, you know, scientifically uh, proved that this will happen on, in this region. Also, the CO2 emissions in this region uh, has been seen, uh, has, you know, has seen an increase uh, in recent uh, decades as a result of uh, the energy consumption. As you know, this region, especially the uh, GCC countries, they are relying a lot on energy and just consuming a lot of energy. Also, uh, and based on this information, the West Asia region is particularly vulnerable to uh, natural hazards and coastal flooding, temperature increase. As you can see from the picture, this is in Oman and Salala, one of the hurricanes that hits the country because as you know from, uh, as a consequence from the climate change. Moving to the nature uh, elements. So uh, the region, as you can see, uh, the first point is uh, the overconsumption of biological uh, resources is beyond the region, uh, the regional capacity. So there is a, a limit that the, reg the, the regional uh, biocapacity can, of the ecosystem can you know, uh, accept. And this uh, pressure is beyond the, the, the acceptance level. Uh, and this pressure is putting the biological resources uh, at risk, resulting in a number of uh, critical challenges uh, biodiversity, uh, to biodiversity and causing further degradation to biodiversity. Talking about pollution, 
West Asia is recognized as one of the major regions uh, where sand and dust storm uh, orig originates, causing environmental, social, and economic impacts. Uh, the level of air uh, pollution or air pollutants in this region increased progressively over the past two decades, contributing to premature death. And uh, relate, in relation to uh, waste management, we also uh, uh, produced um, a waste management outlook for West Asia uh, region to 2019. And based on this report, West Asia generates 60 million tons of municipal wa solid waste annually, and an estimated of 87% of waste goes into land disposal without any uh, management. So as you can see, there are a lot of environmental challenges and uh, issues in the, in the region, specifically that uh, the region is really the geographical and the, the natural, uh, let's say, um, characteristic of the region is very, very harsh uh, uh, to adopt or to, to be resilient to the, uh, any changes. So now talking about the opportunities. And here, uh, two messages I would like to, to convey. Uh, number one, as you, can, as, you, as you saw from the high-level panel, the digital trans transformation in West Asia are increasingly uh, being adopted in different countries, improving environmental sustainability for nature positive economy. So this is uh, proved and uh, we can see it. And I have some examples to, to show to you. And also some governments uh, uh, you will see from the next slides have already recognized the importance of the digital capacity and took some action uh, on the ground. So let's take some examples from the region. Uh, one example uh, from Bahrain, um, as, as you know, Bahrain is building a national data lake, which is the first uh, in the region, uh, covering 73 government entity, the platform solves issues related to valuable data, setting in silos, creating centralized data source for descriptive and predictive analytics that will help the government agency better serve the uh, public. So this is a one good example from Bahrain. The second is from Jordan. And Jordan, uh, we had today uh, the uh, representative from the digital economy ministry. So in Jordan, they have a digital economy ministry and they are really putting the digital transformation as a top priority uh, at the national uh, agenda. In Qatar, they also developed a, the Qatar Smart Program. They, they call it uh, Wadi Tesmo Rakmi or uh, Tesmo uh, uh, Valley, uh, aims to re realize a technological solution and cooperation across sectors consistent with the Qatar vision. So there are a lot of programs going under this, uh, this initiative in Qatar. In uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, um, Saudi Arabia established the uh, uh, Authority for Artificial Intelligence, which is really uh, doing a great job in, in terms of adopting digital technologies in the country. Uh, and they organized last year a global uh, artificial intelligence summit uh, that was organized in October last year. So uh, this is from uh, Saudi Arabia. And lastly, but not least, uh, the UAE also uh, adopted a strategy for artificial intelligence, which where you can see the, the infographic, the, the summary of the, of the artificial intelligence. And you can see clearly in the five circles down, resources uh, and energy is one of the let's say, a priority areas for the strategy. So they are really focusing on using digital tools uh, for resources and energy. And also, in addition to that, UAE has a national innovation strategy, another one, which is uh, focusing on technolo technological innovation and uh, value-added products and services uh, to green markets and economy. So to conclude, um, uh, two messages here. Number one, West Asia region, as you saw, facing a variety of major environmental challenges that necessitate an urgent transformational change. Uh, the second point is policymakers in this region specifically should pay urgent attention to accelerate environmental sustainability 
through digital technology. So with that, I will stop here and thank you for your kind attention. Over to you, Michelle. Thank you, Abdel Menam, and thank you for providing us the detailed environmental scenario in West Asia and also the digital transformation initiative coming from the different governments in the region. So I, I'm sure our audience would also be interested to see how can they get involved in these kinds of initiatives. So for now, um, may we move on to engineer Bayan Mahmoud Atamne to share their experience in Abu Dhabi. Over to you, Ms. Bayan. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. Uh, thanks to you for arranging this gathering and giving me uh, the opportunity to brief you on one of the innovative projects conducted by Environment Agency Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, let me start sharing my presentation. Just a minute. Okay. Let me know if you can see my presentation. Yes, we can. Just a minute, I think I have issues here. Sorry for that. I think because the size of my presentation is a little bit big, uh, my screen is black, just a minute. Let me stop sharing it and sharing, sharing it again. Yes, we can see the presentation. And uh, may we also request um, Engineer Bayan to move closer to the microphone so our interpreters can, uh, uh, it will be easier for our interpreters to translate. Thank you. Yes, can you, sound, can you now see my screen, please? Yes. Is it the full screen? You see the title page now? Is it the full screen? I, I think we can proceed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is it? OK, great. Yeah. So uh, just minute, because I'm not sure if this is full screen or not full screen. Can you confirm this is full screen? It's, it's, full, it's full screen, yeah. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Sorry for any inconvenience. Um, so to start my presentation, inshallah today, uh, I'm going to present uh, uh, this project about monitoring soil quality from space using drones, artificial intelligence, and uh, machine learning. I think the size of the presentation is very big, so okay, great. So I'm facing some technical issues here. Michelle, can we start the next presentation so I can fix things here in my presentation? Okay. 
Um, we can move on to the video message provided by our representative from Ms. Barbara Henry to share the convening and outcomes of, from North America. And then we'll get back to the presentation of engineer Bayan shortly. So um, maybe our host can now start playing the recorded message for Dr. Barbara for this session. Thank you. Hello everyone, Salam. It's great to be with you today for the first ever Digital Transformation Conference for Environmental Sustainability in West Asia. I am Barbara Hendry, the Director of the UN Environment Program Regional Office for North America. We recently had a convening in our region on this topic, and I want to share a few of the outcomes of that conversation with you. Our office covers the US and Canada, and we do have a large concentration of some of the world's biggest tech companies, including Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, and more. So we oriented our digital consultation to reflect this and work together with a regional partner, Future Earth, to convene some of these big players around the table. In fact, we held the meeting under Chatham House rules, so I can't actually name the participants in our conversation. This turned out to be an important element in being able to bring big tech companies to the table as a group, especially in a pre-competitive space. We also brought in a small number of researchers, NGOs, and innovators. So we got two big learnings out of this conversation. First, that there is real enthusiasm in the world of big tech and its associated collaborators to help solve the three planetary crises that we're all facing, the climate crisis, the pollution and waste crisis, and the loss of biodiversity crisis. There was definitely no lack of energy or goodwill on the part of the companies. The trick, of course, is how do we harness this energy and goodwill going forward? Second, there was a clear desire and even a hunger for UNEP leadership in helping set the agenda for how big tech companies engage, what they do, and what priority issues they should focus on. Big tech companies have enormous capabilities to collect, analyze, and present planetary data in a way that can help policymakers solve problems but they need to know what are the specific exam questions that they should be answering. And they think UNEP can play an important role here. These exam questions have to be clear and concrete. They can't be vague or overly process oriented. Companies want clarity from UNEP and from policymakers on the specific issues or problems to be tackled that lend themselves to the application of the sophisticated digital technologies that they can deploy. They want collaboration around specific use cases. And what we heard from them is that they feel that's how partnerships with the big tech world can best go forward most effectively. In fact, our sense was that we would probably struggle to convene these companies again, especially in a pre-competitive space without this clarity of ask. In that regard, participants also identified the need for some sort of architecture for collaboration between digital actors, policymakers, and other stakeholders that can build dialogue and trust. And they thought UNEP could play a role here too with its unique ability to catalyze multi-stakeholder collaborations. Finally, as I said, there was throughout our convening a genuine desire for digital transformation to serve both people and planet. How to ensure that happens in a highly competitive and lucrative marketplace 
and how we knit together public and private stakeholders to move that agenda forward with purpose is a question that we're really focusing on now in our region. And we are very excited, very keen to hear the learning from your region as we plan forward on this. So I want to close by wishing you a very productive and insightful conversation and to thank you so much for allowing me to share our experience here in North America. Thank you. Um, we'd like to thank um, Ms. Barbara Henry, um, who wasn't able to join us today, but uh, has kindly um, sent her video message for this session. And um, maybe we can now go to engineer uh, Bayan Atkamne um, for her presentation. Um, if you're... Um, let me start sharing my screen. Yes, please. If not, we can also share the presentation and our end. Let us know. Thank you. Can you share the presentation from your side? Sure, I uh, will do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, Engineer Bayan, um, you can now proceed. We have your presentation up. Yes, Okay, thank you very much. I'm really sorry for uh, any inconvenience. So uh, to start my presentation, inshallah, today I'm going to present one of our innovative projects, monitoring soil quality from space using drones, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Uh, I would like to start by noting that this is a multidisciplinary project. Can you, next slide, please. Michelle, can you hear me? Yes, okay. So uh, I would like to start by noting this is a multidisciplinary project that includes uh, soil specialists, remote sensing specialists, GIS specialists, environmental data management programmers, machine learning, and AI specialists. Actually, the team are being, uh, let's say, brought to Abu Dhabi from around the globe, and they are all working together to, wish, to push this innovative project towards success. Next please. So soil is uh, a core resource for our planet. Soil health can have significant influence over many other ecosystems in it. In fact, many global policies, frameworks, including the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, directly and indirectly addresses land and soil. So if you can make another clip here, uh, Michelle. So here, soil health falls under a total of seven of the 17 SDGs, and it is tied to water, air quality, uh, preventing hunger, uh, reducing climate change, uh, improving population and well beings, and living standards. So, many of these SDGs cannot be achieved without healthy soil and sustainable land use. Next slide, please. So, understanding the importance of soil. Uh, AED, Environment Agency Abu Dhabi, made it one of its strategic priorities. We had started conducting a number of soil related initiatives uh, starting 2009. Currently, the highlight of its initiatives is the Soil Quality Monitoring Program, which aims at understanding the temporal change in soil quality resulting from man made activities. Today, inshallah, I will give you a quick brief on uh, this program, the beginnings, current status, and future outlook. 
Back in 2018, we started the first round of the monitoring program with around 100 sites and a total of 200 samples. And actually, uh, uh, this, this uh, 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 modest beginning allowed us to determine the baseline for soil quality. Moving forward, after four years, we are now in our fourth cycle of the monitoring program. The program is now uh, certified by ISO as the first soil monitoring program in the NINA region having this certificate. In addition, the number of monitoring sites has increased to 370 sites with more than 600 soil samples per year. Next slide, please. So, however, although the program is evolving, but conventional methods of monitoring are unfortunately limited. Uh, let's say the current program has its limitation to, uh, let's say, due to uh, uh, its conventional method, which includes the need for manpower as it is a labor intensive, as we all know. It has issues of representation, as we usually, uh, let's say, rely on a sample to represent large area, because, uh, let's say, sampling all area is not realistically practical. Moreover, increasing the coverage is difficult as it requires more manpower and more sampling. So finally, frequent sampling will multiply all those factors again. If you can make a clip here, please. So this means growing in any direction will result in increased cost, increased time to complete uh, and produce results, thus delaying decisions. And finally, it, inter it introduced a decrease in accuracy and representation. Therefore, we have to think of an innovative way to overcome all these limitations. You can make clear, please. Okay. So therefore, we have to think of an innovative way to overcome all these limitations to be able to improve our monitoring program, or maybe at one point replace it with futuristic method of monitoring. We are looking for, can you just complete clicking? Yes, until then. So we are looking for innovative techniques that should allow regular monitoring, uh, be efficient, accurate, and be uh, extended easily. So talking about pandemic uh, these days, it should also be safe uh, to display under the current and future situations. So here comes the soil mapping using drone, artificial intelligence, and remote sensing. Actually, the ultimate goal of this project is to make the transition from the traditional methods to monitor, uh, uh, of monitoring, let's say, to more innovative technologies that will augment the traditional techniques. This slide demonstrates the methodology specifically deployed or developed for implementing this project. The method was developed to provide the necessary data that will allow the correlation between the remote sensing data and ground sensing data. Actually, this big data will be fed into an AI machine learning model to predict soil contamination. Right now, we are collecting spectral data from the soil. We are doing it with a spectral radiometer that is collecting light reflected by soil from 400 to 2,500 nanometers. We are doing it with a spectral radiometer collecting data 20 centimeters higher. With this, we are going to get the spectral signature of the soil and all the contaminants on it. The second scale is drone-based remote sensing technology. We are flying with this hyperspectral sensor. This is a full camera with three sensors on it. We have a visual and near-infrared sensor, we have a shortwave infrared sensor, and we have a laser scanner, all together and coordinated. This is flown by a drone that we have behind. The drone is flying at 30 meters, 60 meters, and 90 meters high. What we want to do here is to see different resolutions from the ground, so we can then find the best configuration for the sensor, drone, and reliability of our detection method to be able to set the characteristics for the flight. The third way we are going to collect data in this project is satellite data. The satellite has a large footprint, and we can collect massive amount of data. We are going to use machine learning to find a correlation between all the spectral information and the soil contaminants characteristics. Okay, great. Actually, we shared here uh, a short video from the field. 
you were listening to Dr. Fran Garcia, uh, 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 the lead remote sensing specialist on this project. And uh, he, he was talking about the sensor and the techniques in general. So that was a quick briefing on the technology used in, in this project. Now moving to the next slide. So now we know something about the project and its implementation, but what are the main outcomes of this project and what benefits are coming back to the environment agency and the environment? First of all, accuracy. Actually, a hyperspectral drone sensor provided promising initial results for the identification of concentration of certain contaminants, such as arsenic, lead, nickel, cobalt, and copper, all scoring above 60% accuracy. And actually, this level of accuracy will grow with the growth of the training data uh, fed to the AI model. So the more flight we do, the more data that is generated, and the more the accuracy we will get. Moving to the second benefit, which is efficiency. No, back, please. So moving to the second benefit, which is efficiency. So each flight is expected to cover an area of almost 1.5 hectare. So an average of five sites per day will be surveyed, totaling 7.5 hectares. Moreover, the hyperspectral sensor provided, let's say, data with a resolution of five centimeters. So imagine if we want to cover 5.7 hectares with the traditional sampling and taking a sample for every five centimeters. And this is, let's say, realistically impossible and simply cannot be done. Moving to the next slide, cost effective. Actually, drone surveys are conducted faster, requiring less time with less manpower to cover wider areas than traditional surveys. The result, reducing time, reducing overall cost. Moreover, drone surveys allows rapid action and interventions, which addresses the cost of remediation and intervention. Intelligent AI. Now, with each new flight, the model learns new patterns and become smarter. It will be able to increase production accuracy, requiring this ground truthing sampling to the extent where it might replace traditional methods. So moving to the next slide now, safety. And actually, this is one of the very important methods of utilizing this technology. Actually, field visits for, uh, let's say, conventional soil sample collection does not come with it is potential uh, safety issues. Uh, for example, the exposure of field technicians to potential contaminated soil, the need to, uh, to go off-road uh, to remote sites, the sampling process itself, and the potential for injury. All of these risks can be easily avoided when doing the survey using remote sensing. Monitoring is done without the need for human uh, access to site. Uh, less need for sample collection, environmental, Proactivity versus activity will protect the environment from potential contamination instead of reacting to an existing contamination. And finally, COVID-19. Actually, this type of remote sensing techniques will stop for nothing. Not even COVID-19 could stop you from scheduling a, a drone flight or analyzing a set, set, a set of satellite imagery to get your scheduled data set. added value. So actually this project comes with many additional added value on top. First of all, point source mapping. We can enhance analysis and interpretation by mapping possible point sources such as proximity to particular industrial activities or uh, let's say the suitable placing for residential areas or infrastructure. So this is something difficult to see from a first person uh, view. Another added value is building of spectral library. Actually, this is will be the first in the region, and there is a great need for it. Uh, uh, most, uh, most, let's say, uh, spectral libraries are specific to the US and do not translate very well our unique environment. So there is a need to have uh, to, 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 uh, to, de to develop such a uh, library. This technology can also be used to monitor other environmental assets, for example, marine water quality and air, water and air quality. Uh, the data can also be used by enforcement and permitting team to check compliance and ensure proper actions were taken by, by involved parties. And finally, fill the historic data gaps. We may use, uh, let's say, the algorithm to uh, apply to historical satellite data available so we can explore trends which will greatly improve our knowledge 
and enhance our modeling capabilities. So finally, capacity building. Actually, this innovative project was an opportunity to build our capacity and bring this new technology into actual implementation. That's it from my presentation. Thank you very much for uh, listening. I'm, I'm again, sorry for any uh, technical uh, issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Engineer Bayan, for sharing the experience you have in Abu Dhabi. So um, maybe we can take one or two questions from the audience since um, we have another session um, for the pollution section of this conference. Um, maybe I would like to address the question to David. Um, we have here a question for David. Um, let me go there. Yeah. Um, uh, there's one. Um, Coming from the audience, there are a lot of digital platforms and environmental database and data lakes residing in silos, um, either from private sector and, or various institutions. Um, is there a global framework that uh, would guide this integration or data sharing uh, among different users? Over to you, David. Thank you. That's a fantastic question and a great observation. And that's exactly one of the things that we'd like to do in UNEP. We've got these two investments. The one is called the World Environment Situation Room, where we're trying to aggregate the best available data on different environmental variables into one platform um, so it can be easily accessed and, and we can stop this fragmentation process. But probably the more or the, act, the equally important investment is looking at this issue of an API for Earth framework, right? Getting these application programming interfaces um, and getting a framework for environmental data so that these APIs can be interconnected and so this data can flow into this digital ecosystem. So to develop that API for Earth framework, we need to agree on a basic sort of taxonomy for how do we structure this data? What are the standards for the data? And then we need to agree on what is the trust framework uh, in terms of contributing your data you know, to that API for Earth framework. So there's a number of issues to work out, but if we can work out this API for Earth framework and this and this standard, that would really uh, do a lot towards addressing this fragmentation and then allowing that data to flow into this world environment situation room. Thank you, David. Um, we also have one question. I think um, this is for Abdelmenem. Um, we have seen successes of digital technology implementation in other West, West Asia countries. Um, how does UNEP ensure and what's uh, UNEP's role in making sure that the capacity is uh, equally distributed and digital tr transformation does not uh, widen the readiness and capacity gaps among nations? Um, over to you, Abdel Menon. Thank you, Michelle. This is again a very uh, good question uh, for us, and um, this is why, uh, you know, as as mentioned in the previous uh, this, uh, presentations, uh, UNEP is uh, adopting a new program for digital transformation. This is uh, now agreed by member state in the uh, medium term strategy, which starts 2022 next year. So, digital transformation. This is one of the core let's say a program for, for UNEP uh, globally. In our region and similar to the other regions, uh, we are at the mapping stage, if you wish, now identifying what are exactly the regional uh, priority needs for each region so that for digital technology, for digital transformation, so that when we start operational uh, next year in 2022, we uh, as UNEP know exactly what are the needs in, in, in each region. So during the discussion from this uh, conference and also we are doing this uh, studies and uh, we are identifying the priority for different uh, countries to make sure that our program when we start uh, next year, we are responding to the needs or to the member states and making sure the, uh, the the digital divide is, is, is well addressed in, in this region. As we know, there are different capacity in different countries. So we are really uh, cautious about this limitation and we will uh, hopefully uh, address that in our uh, new strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Abdel Menom. Um, uh, we have a question for Ms. Bayan, but um, 
I, I think we can just uh, email and uh, Ms. Bayan will respond to those questions uh, directly. Um, we have now come to the end of our productive session and I'd like to thank our panelists today for sharing their insights and experience. Um, please stay tuned to our next and uh, next session for the day, Digital Transformation and Three Planetary Crisis, focusing on tackling pollution. Um, let me now hand it over to the moderator of your session, um, Ingara Milvakam, um, for the pollution session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on your time zone. Let me uh, welcome you all to this uh, session on tackling pollution. Uh, my name is Ainkara, the coordinator of chemical uh, waste and air quality in the unit research office. And with me uh, today, we have uh, four distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, Mr. John Buckford, the director of the air quality monitoring at the IQ Air, uh, Dr. Farah. Barwani, the Research and Development Manager at Bayer, Oman. Uh, we also have uh, engineer Majid Aladwan uh, from the head of the State of Environment uh, and Environment Indicator Section at the Ministry of Environment, uh, Jordan. And uh, last but not least, we also have Mohammad uh, Ayub, a Senior Research Director at the Environment Sustainability Center of the Kata Environment and Energy Research Institute. The pollution is one of the three uh, triple planetary crises. Uh, it, it's key uh, globally and regionally. Uh, for example, air pollution, which attributes to nearly 7 million uh, deaths annually, is the greatest environmental risk to human health. Asia, West Asia is particularly vulnerable to the pollution effect due to its, uh, its natural uh, desert, uh, as well as scarcity of water resources. Annually, uh, the, the annual uh, waste generation has reached over 60 million tons per year. And only 11% is around 11% is treated and the rest uh, to be taken care of. The good news is, as mentioned by the UNEP HUD director during the opening session, uh, solutions are available uh, and we need to put them into practice. And the digital, uh, trans digital technology is an option here or so tool here. So, Today in this session, we are going to uh, explore how the digital technology can help us to implement this solution for the pollution issue. So without uh, further ado, uh, first I would uh, like to invite Mr. Jan to talk about how the artificial intelligence can help to power in the air quality data by using uh, this experience and also uh, going to the VCS region. Yeah, Jan, the floor is yours. Hi, so hi everyone, and thank you, Ingera, for the introduction. So today uh, I'd like to speak about air pollution and how new technology, especially AI, have been able to change the way we report and we collect and process air quality data. Uh, I assume, by the way, that you can see my screen. If you don't, please. Just let me know. Okay, all good. All right. So, uh, but before to, to get into the topic, uh, just to give you a bit of background. So, I, I work for a private company called IQ Air. We are actually working into uh, collecting and processing that air quality data, and we are serving millions of people around the world. And you can also experience, uh, of course, for free, <laughs> this type of uh, air quality data by just downloading, for example, this air visual app that you can find on your App Store or Google Play. But we're also known uh, for uh, actually writing and issuing a report once a year in March about air quality. 
world air quality and you see a ranking of the cities the most polluted cities around the world so you usually would see that on cnn and quite a few different uh, reports and also on the other side uh, we provide with the unep uh, this uh, real-time air quality uh, database that you can see through ways of map also api so having said that i think today the topic is about air quality uh, also related to west asia uh, unfortunately for west asia the air pollution is not really great. I think it suffers from two main types of pollutants. It's like what we call uh, fine particle matters, like PM2.5 or PM10, which is more like coarse particles, a bit bigger, which usually tends to be from sandstorm or from a burning uh, like oil refineries or like cars, uh, car exhaust and so on. Uh, but on the other side, even though the air pollution is actually quite critical in this region, the awareness is actually very low. So we need to do something to change this one. And what we are seeing is that there's a real need for real-time air quality data so that people can protect themselves once they understand the pollution that is affecting them. And as you can see on the map here, this is a map that you can access uh, on your computer. Uh, and you can see the number of points uh, there, it's actually quite limited. That's the number of ground air monitors that are deployed in the region. Compared to other countries, that's actually very few monitors. So how can we change that? How can we get more relevant, more real-time, more useful air quality data to the population so they can protect themselves better? There's kind of three options. On one way, you can deploy reference sensors. Those are kind of big machines which are when it's expensive, it costs about $100,000 to $200,000 to deploy and maintain on a yearly basis, but they are pretty good. But the problem is you can't just put hundreds or thousands of them. On the, uh, on the other side, even those ones are very accurate, but on the other side, you have something what we call low-cost sensors, which has been a very hot trend in the air monitoring industry in the last few years. They are like very cheap, I mean, very cheap, let's say less than $500 US dollar, uh, per piece. Uh, the good thing is they have new technology. They are a lot more real time. Uh, so for, for that, you know, you can deploy basically 200 of those devices compared to reference sensor, but they have also limitations. So you, they have affected by humidity, temperature, different types of particles. You know, if it's a sandstorm, uh, you'd have actually maybe wrong readings unless you recalibrate this kind of thing. So lots of things to be able to deal with this data. So not that straightforward. Great way to deploy hundreds of them in a country, in a city, uh, but you need to be able to handle all those limitations to make sense and provide uh, reliable data. And then another third option is to use satellite imagery. Uh, the satellites are taking pictures maybe once a day or twice a day. Uh, they measure what we call a column. So you don't really necessarily know what the air quality at the bottom, at the ground level, compared to what the satellite measures. So this is one of the limitation uh, that it, it helps to have a bit of visibility, but not always fully accurate at ground level. So we've got kind of three options. And uh, those three options, once they are independent from each other, they have their limitation. But if you put them together and you add a layer of machine learning on top of this, you can actually get a great output, uh, meaning a very good accuracy of the air pollution, air quality data uh, by uh, applying AI. So that's, how, that's what we did. So as we had the largest database of air quality data, uh, we put about six years of uh, data from those reference sensors from satellite data, and I'm talking satellite, different types of satellites, uh, weather data, fire data, I want to say here wildfire type of data. Um, also those local sensors, like about five years of them, and especially local sensors placed next to reference sensors. So we put all that data, make it crunched by our system so that our system could find patterns, could understand how a local sensor is affected by humidity, uh, how it should be recalibrated. And the beauty of uh, AI is that it manages to, um, when it crunches, it crunches this data, it's uh, able to actually find out those patterns and give great output. So we could validate sensor data, calibrate those local sensors, uh, adjust the satellite data, and also something quite cool is like to forecast uh, the air pollution. So that's one of the application of uh, machine learning and how it's been, uh, you know, from a technical point of view, it's been really changing the game 
about air pollution. You combine three types of data sources, which each of them have their own problems, but you actually make take the strength of those three different options into making something uh, very useful for, for the world. So in terms of results, I think uh, you can just see it by for yourself is go on those maps, go on the like the UNEP map to really understand how we can make that data relatable, uh, especially give the context around that data. So I think those maps to me, especially the maps that we have the, developed with the UNEP, I think are really quite inspiring and useful for, for us to understand the flow of pollution around the world. Uh, also, you can, as I said earlier, you can actually also download, uh, for example, this Air Visual app that will provide you with air quality forecast and also tell you what to do in case of air pollution. Because if you know oh, air pollution is bad, what, what's next? You know, you need to, to provide actionable um, solutions for them to, to protect themselves. And uh, the, the result of this one, also working with the UNEP, is that we have been able to uh, to really deploy this uh, high accuracy air quality data to millions of people around the world. I think that's really an achievement when you are able to make people realize that uh, the air pollution is an issue and then they can actually take action to protect themselves or even to push for policies to be implemented to improve the environment. Uh, I'd like to just finish with this slide about, uh, you know, technology is great, but uh, if it's not shared, it doesn't really go forward. So what I'd like you also, if you want to be involved into this air pollution, uh, let's call it movement to, to share. It's like you can just share your measurements of your air pollution wherever you are, uh, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, uh, through screenshots of apps or so on. Uh, the other also options you can do is actually to uh, join this air quality community, this, which is also um, managed also by, by the UNEP, where you can deploy local centers. So you are at the university, at a school, you can deploy a center there in your home, or as outside of your home or at your office. There's this kind of sensors that you can deploy and share with the rest of the community so that you can actually create this awareness that is so badly needed. Um, I'd like to just stop with uh, these uh, few words and uh, as you have hopefully some time, go on this UNEP maps that we have uh, been, been building collaboratively with the uh, UNEP and uh, just experience for yourself uh, how air quality data is visualized and just keep in mind this has been done using machine learning in the background. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jan. I, actually, you Using the satellite, you know, when we come to the air quality, uh, approaching or addressing air quality, monitoring is actually play a central role in managing air quality. Uh, in order to do that, the satellite technology and, and the ground monitoring have been there. It is good that you bring the artificial intelligence into it, not only to monitor, but also to disseminate to the right uh, audience. So thank you for that. Uh, next, uh, uh, we have uh, Dr. Farah Barwani. Uh, so I will invite Dr. Farah Barwani to talk about uh, the technologies in the field of circular economy and sustainability. So circular economy is a key for uh, all the pollution areas. So Dr. Farah, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will assume you can see my presentation. Please let me know if you can't. Um, uh, as uh, Ingara said, I'm uh, Farah Al Barwani, and I'm from the Sultanate of Oman. And uh, basically, I work at the uh, Oman's Environmental Services Company, or we manage waste in Oman. And our uh, vision really is to conserve the environment of our beautiful Oman for future generations. So look beyond just managing the waste to see how we can minimize the environmental impact of that waste and to see how we can use that waste as a resource to support our economy. So uh, just a quick uh, uh, brief of what BIA is. Um, when we started uh, back in 2012, uh, we, uh, Oman had around uh, 300 open dump sites that have substantial environmental impact. So one of the first things that we did was decommission the dump sites, build 
really um, uh, built to inv um, international standards to really minimize that environmental impact and move towards um, conserving our environment. So as I said, first we built the infrastructure, uh, commenced operation. Now we cover waste collection for the entire Sultanate and we move towards excellent sustainability and waste diversion where our goal is to divert 80% of generated uh, municipal solid waste from our landfills by 2030. Now, how are we planning to achieve that? Um, that is a big uh, goal. So we really need to move towards a sustainable future and utilize a circular economy. And we've heard that a number of times, and I'm sure most people know what that is, but just quickly, Currently, we're mainly working in a linear economy where we take resources, we make our products, we dispose, and at each point, we're generating waste and utilizing natural resources. And what we need to be doing um, is really uh, to achieve our SDGs and become more sustainable is to transition to a circular economy, whereby we minimize our use of uh, raw materials, we keep our materials circling for longer, and then minimize the amount of waste that's produced at the end. Now, when we talk about these things, it's very, you know, one of the biggest enablers is technologies. And we've, we've heard these words from all the different presenters, things like artificial intelligence, blockchain, advanced robotics, big data, internet of things, and smart tagging and sensing. All of these play a, a key role. But we also can't forget some of the simpler technologies that maybe are not part of the fourth industrial revolution, but are still essential. Things like transforming uh, from open dump sites to using uh, engineered landfills can have a substantial impact on our environment. So um, where in the cycle can you use technologies? Pretty much throughout. And in, in fact, if we, the only way to achieve a circular economy would be to incorporate these technologies throughout. So for example, design. When you design our product and services, we need to be designing with reuse and to eliminate waste. Um, and that can, uh, you know, things like artificial intelligence uh, can play a key role. There. An example is Unilever. What they did with uh, their uh, Dove, Dove brand is to produce a deodorant that is um, reusable or deodorant casing that's reusable with a lifetime guarantee. Now, the idea here is that you're minimizing waste and allowing you to use the same product throughout your lifetime. Once you've designed your product, there comes the production or manufacturing process. Now, of course, there's so many different products and services. Um, and so as we produce our different products, different technologies will play a part. Things like industrial symbiosis, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, and robotics. And one uh, example from the region um, is Dar al Arkan from Saudia. And what they've done is they've started incorporating 3D printing into their construction process, really allowing them to become more efficient, produce less waste, and be safer. Once you've produced your products, you then need to distribute it. And um, really, technology plays a key ro role in uh, becoming more circular in this area. So we need to be able to generate data to understand what's happening, where the challenges are, and to find solutions. So tracking and monitoring technologies, the Internet of Things, blockchain, and artificial intelligence really play a key role. Um, and one international example is the brand E.ON. Um, and what they've done is worked with a number of different, um, uh, a number of different brands such as H&M uh, to tag clothing um, to allow it to be easier to recycle at the end. I think we had discussions about that earlier in previous sessions. And I believe the next presentation will really talk about distribution and, and following the life cycle of products. Then um, the consumer, uh, once the product hit us, it's very important that we have the right information that we are able to make the most sustainable, um, more environmentally friendly choices. So things like awareness, nudging, using blockchain applications and artificial intelligence can really make a difference here. Um, and for example, Anova, another global company, um, have added barcodes to their products that allow the consumer to track um, where they've come. So for example, if I purchase a fish that was fished in Thailand, I know where it was fished, how it was packaged, how it was transported, and so on. So that again, I can make the most sustainable choice um, as the consumer. 
once we've gone through the cycle, hopefully as we become more circular and we incorporate these technologies to help divert us from our linear economy, there won't be much waste. But at the moment there's a substantial amount of waste that's generated and that's where BIA comes in. Um, in Oman, we manage the waste throughout the country, as I said, and we help try and divert towards recycling and recover. So we manage all solid waste in Oman. Uh, for time's sake, I'm only really going to quickly highlight the municipal solid waste in some of the areas that we're working. But keep in mind that this is, uh, you know, I mean, there are other strategies and other technologies that are important within our other streams. And so we have our collection, our fleet uh, collecting the waste from our bins. Um, most of the waste currently ends up in the landfill, sadly, as uh, was highlighted um, earlier uh, in the, the, the region, still mainly landfills the waste. However, we have made sure that these are up to um, international standards, minimizing the environmental impact. But some of the waste now goes to um, a material recovery facility that allows us to segregate recyclables, primarily plastic at this point, um, that then can be recycled. And we also have a waste to energy project, actually a number of waste to energy projects in the works. And uh, the first one should be um, operational by 2026, I believe. Um, hopefully that will really help drive us towards achieving our diversion goals. Now, where does technology uh, fit in over here? Throughout the process, basically at each step of the way, technology can help facilitate um, our progress towards sustainability and towards a circular economy. So for example, our trucks um, have uh, IVMS systems that allow us to track them and know what's going on. Our bins have RFIDs, or at least most of them do. Um, and our landfill also will generate data through our wave bridges. So as we collect data from our different sources and put them to what we're building, which is a, a control tower, that will allow us to get live data that will help us and in, make informed decisions, maybe streamline our processes and become more sustainable, more efficient. And the plan is hopefully to then link with our different stakeholders. So our waste uh, generators, as well as our waste collectors, maybe our uh, material recovery facilities, our recyclers, as we bring in different uh, entities towards a shared platform, that again allows us to further move towards circularity and towards a sustainable future. Um, you know, mentioning advanced robotics that also plays a role. So for example, our material recovery facility now is annually managed. However, there are examples whereby advanced robotics and artificial intelligence can help streamline that process, making it more effective, more uh, safer, and um, again, help us in our transition. So what are the ways forward? I kind of touched on our control tower project, trying to collect um, uh, data in a central database that allows us to gather live data, helping hopefully move towards a more efficient system. Um, that is a work in progress. We also tend to support the identification of optimal processes and technologies for recycling and recovery in the country. Um, uh, recycling, as we all know, there's so many different streams and there's so many different technologies that can be used for recycling, but they're not all created equal. Some of them have a larger environmental impact or environmental footprint than others. So we try and support moving in the right direction. We're also generating a fourth industrial revolution report that should be done by the end of the year. And the idea there is that we want to look at all of our different stakeholders and identify how we can serve them better, how we can uh, improve our services, but also help move towards sustainable operations and sustainable waste management in Oman. And we also support innovation with research and development, and we have an SME accelerator supporting small businesses that work um, in the field of circular economy and environmental sustainability. But I'd just like to highlight that us as we are play a, a, a key but small part. There are so many other government and uh, private entities in Oman that are also moving towards uh, circular economy and sustainability, and it's all in line with in 2040 that really highlights uh, creating a society of create, uh, creative individuals that are innovating for the future, um, creating a competitive economy where we use those innovations to really drive our economy. And also, of course, um, going towards a, a future where we're protecting our environment and um, uh, sustainably utilizing our resources. And that um, is in line with our SDGs. 
So I think the more we work together as a local community, as a regional community, and as that big uh, global community, the more we'll facilitate making these technologies and these opportunities more realistic, more attainable, and allow us to achieve what may to some people um, seem like a dream. Um, so um, with that, I come to the end of my presentation. Um, and um, I look forward to working with our collaborators uh, towards our shared goal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Farah. You, you really highlighted the areas where the digital technology can uh, influence the circular economy. Circular economy has different stages and it's good to know that every stage is the digital technology can be a key tool to promote the, the circularity. Uh, when we look at the circular economy and the waste management, and the digital technology, one of the key areas is actually tracking the waste uh, using the uh, digital technology. So now we have uh, 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 engineer Majid and the one to talk about how we can use the digital technology to, to track the waste uh, using this experience in, in Jordan. So engineer Majid, the floor is here. Thank you, Ingara. Uh, is the presentation clear on the full screen? Yes, clear. Thank you. Uh, thank you much, very much, Ingara. And I would like to thank UNIP for uh, organizing this uh, event. And of course, many thanks to my colleague who has already uh, presented their uh, contribution in this uh, session and to everybody with us uh, today. Uh, I will be talking about the, um, in the theme of digital transformation, of course, I will be talking about the digital tools and waste management, specifically about uh, Jordan's uh, National Monitoring Information System for Waste, which has been developed with the support of EU to serve as a national information system on waste and a tool to monitor the implementation and the progress of uh, our national waste management strategy. Uh, the system is currently now in its final testing stage and it will be uh, launched uh, very soon. So the idea of the system was to design, uh, develop, and implement a comprehensive uh, computerized uh, and web-enabled application called the National Monitoring Information System for Waste. Uh, the main objective was to facilitate the collection of data and the progress reporting of implementation of waste and uh, implementation, of course, of, uh, of waste management plans and waste management strategy uh, and environmental control in a time, uh, in a real-time manner and support the evidence-based decision-making and the management. Of course, also uh, the objective is to strengthen the capacity of Ministry of Environment to perform its uh, environmental monitoring rules in, uh, on existing uh, waste management facility and the new ones, of course. Uh, the information system was uh, developed in a user-friendly way uh, that offers a dashboard user interface where users can easily log in view, update, or interact with the system, generate reports, or follow uh, indicators. Uh, this is the main page or the home page of the system. Uh, as again, it is a web-enabled system, so it can be accessed from your computer or smartphone, from work or home or any place in the world. Uh, and we will have uh, information available for the general public on the home page, and we will have a user account interface for stakeholders uh, to uh, perform their, ro their roles and responsibilities on the system. Uh, this is the user interface for inside the user account. And this system um, is organized in a friendly way, as said before, as a dashboard, uh, in which we will have all types of land management, uh, uh, waste management facilities as the landfill, transfer stations, incineration plants, autoclaves, we will also have a uh, border for, uh, for uh, waste uh, generators, for recyclers, uh, also for the municipalities to update their uh, information about waste management capabilities, about uh, uh, population data, uh, about connected landfill and transfer station. We will also have accounts for Ministry of uh, Water, uh, Department of Statistics, uh, uh, landfill operators from uh, Ministry of uh, Local Administration and Greater Amman Municipality, 
So basically, all stakeholders will be involved as use, active users in this uh, account. Another important part of the system is also the reporting and indicators in which we can follow up live the indicators of waste management process and generate any customized report is needed. So basically, uh, the system will be fed by uh, data from all the sor available sources in the waste management process, whether a real-time live data or it can be updated uh, on a regular uh, agreed uh, periods. We will have uh, inputs from waste recyclers, waste generators. We will have real-time data on environmental uh, monitoring uh, coming from the environmental monitoring stations in the main landfill, uh, data also coming from municipalities. Uh, also, we'll have live data coming on delivered waste uh, to the main landfills and transfer stations. All these information and other will be fed to the system and will be organized in a form of live databases. And the system will generate updated indicators and all the uh, uh, users from stakeholders can also benefit from extracting and generating customized reports according to their uh, requirements. Here is an example about the interface uh, for a landfill, uh, 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 connected landfill to the system, which is one of the main waste treatment facilities. So if we go to the landfill uh, interface, you can see a lot of details here. We will have the uh, landfill management under which we can have information about the landfill itself, the specification, the owner uh, details information, the operator information, number of cells, uh, number of employees, uh, inventory of waste management equipment inside the landfills and other. Also, we can have information about waste delivered in a, in a live and a real time manner to the landfill. As you can see here, we will have the waste uh, as maybe it can be done by up to, the, up to day for a year or a daily view for all waste delivered to the landfill. So all trucks will be registered and uh, uh, expressed live in the system. We will have the exact day and time of arrival of the waste the transfer truck, the exact delivered uh, uh, weight of the waste, the design capacity of the truck, uh, the waste type, uh, the owner or the origin of the waste uh, from where it's coming, and also inv information about the driver and plate number. Uh, along with the delivered weight, this information will be used later to evaluate the efficiency of waste uh, transfer process. Another thing that can be shown under this example is the waste disposed, the details about the waste disposed, whether in a daily view or a yearly view. So for example, if we want, if we want to look at a certain day, we can see the total amount of waste delivered and the uh, segregated type of waste and uh, the weight of each type. This is uh, the same can be expressed on a yearly view, of course. Uh, also, uh, we, uh, it can show the citizens served by this specific facility and the connected municipality which will be served from this uh, uh, facility. And this is a dynamic list. We can, it can be updated and modified uh, easily. Uh, also very important to show the disposal history, the, all the historical data of waste uh, that was disposed in this facility. So you will have all the disposed uh, information, the historical data from 2012 up till uh, uh, last year. And of course, from now on, all the information will be fed automatically from the web bridges. Uh, another information that's available under this uh, page is the GII, GIS services of, of the landfill, which will show the, the area of the landfill, the address, the direction, the borders of the landfill. Also, there will be a landfill parameter measurements. Uh, this is concerned with any testing or survey or sample analysis or lab analysis that is performed. So we can take all these uh, results for gas, leachate, groundwater, or even the area and capacity, and upload these uh, results to be saved under this uh, uh, landfill. Another important information coming to the system from an environmental point of view, is the data coming from the real time monitoring on environment. So we will have, we will have the devices and sensors uh, to monitor uh, landfill gas. For example, we monitor the, in one landfill where we have a gas collection system, we monitor the exact amount of gas generated. We monitor also the percentage or the composition of the gas, percentage of methane, percentage of CO2, uh, H2S. Uh, and also in this landfill, which is an Al-Gabawi site, 
uh, we have a power generation uh, plant in which uh, we use the landfill gas and generate electricity. From environment point of view, also we are monitoring the emission after the power generation plant. So we are uh, uh, monitoring the emission of uh, uh, methane, CO2, NOxes, H2S, SO2 also after that. Uh, another environmental parameters that is monitors, uh, monitored also is the quality of uh, groundwater around landfill. So in the, man, in the main landfills or where is, where is available a uh, very close uh, uh, well, we monitor real-time data for conductivity. And in remote area, we have a yearly sampling campaigns and we get uh, detailed uh, lab analysis for these sites uh, to make sure that the groundwater is well preserved and there is no environmental impact from landfills uh, uh, on the water resources there. Uh, also, we monitor in this regard the uh, quantity and the quality of leachate uh, generated in uh, sanitary landfills. Uh, the, the other part of the system, which is the key performance indicators, uh, we have uh, many uh, indicators available in our system. For example, we have a set of indicators concerned with the monitoring of uh, waste quantity. We have indicator in municipal waste generation. Uh, we have indicators on uh, uh, composition of municipal uh, solid waste. And this is updated as where the studies, maybe every three or five years, whenever a new study is done by the related authority, it will be updated in the system and available. We have indicators on the percentage of municipal waste delivered to official facilities, percentage of total municipal waste recycled. And this will depend later on on the information that is entered by waste recyclers. So it's a dynamic information. We also will have information about municipal solid waste quantity disposed either in sanitary or non-sanitary landfills. Of course, the non-sanitary landfill, by, by, uh, when accomplishing the strategy, they will be closed, fully closed, and all the landfill will be uh, of a sanitary type after implementing the strategy. And also, we will have indicators about uh, the yearly generated quantities of leachate and biogas collected from sanitary landfills. The other set of indicators is, uh, will be concerned with the waste operation performance indicators, specifically on waste collection and treatments. Uh, so we will have indicators about coverage of municipal solid waste street cleaning and collection, capacity of uh, waste management in both landfill and municipalities in terms of available resources and sorry equipment. Uh, also, there will be indicators about citizens served by sanitary landfills, uh, capacity of disposing of municipal solid waste in sanitary landfills in terms it will show the available free volume in the cells in, in all the sanitary landfills. And the final set of uh, uh, environmental uh, impact indicator, which concerned with, uh, with the impact of landfills or uh, even any uh, waste management facility on water resources and ambient air, we will have uh, also information about the quantity of methane burnt either to, to the flare or going to the waste to energy plants. Uh, we will have also indicators about uh, quality of groundwater and uh, TOC of groundwater in the surrounding of uh, landfills in which we will monitor the impacts over the year and make sure it's, it is uh, well preserved. And we will also have an uh, environment indicator about area of uh, rehabilitated and vegetated unlined landfill when once they are closed, of course, number and count of controlled unlined landfills in coastal area and seas of operation of uh, unclosed controlled or unlined landfills. Uh, finally, I would like to, uh, to highlight uh, some of the features and uh, value added uh, by implementing this uh, digital tool. Uh, of course, this information system uh, will contribute to increase the availability and the quality of waste management data for all stakeholders involved. Uh, uh, it is a functional uh, tool for monitoring and assessment of any plan or strategy that is implement, uh, implemented nationally related to waste. And uh, it, uh, the information system definitely will increase and strengthen the capacity of Ministry of Environment to perform its uh, monitoring role on existing and new waste management facilities. Uh, the system by itself is, uh, is modular and flexible in design, meaning that Whenever uh, a new uh, waste management facility is coming to operation, we can define it and add it easy to the system. And even we can add a new uh, rules and function to the system itself. Uh, the system definitely improve and will improve uh, the efficiency of quality 
uh, of data sharing between the local entity in waste management because uh, it will be instantaneous. Yani once you look in, you will see the same information at uh, within all stakeholders. There is no need for uh, uh, old-fashioned communication and exchange of information because you are talking about a national system here. And of course, uh, users will be um, uh, easily uh, uh, capable of extracting, exporting, and exchanging data easily from this live database and using even customized uh, filters to generate uh, reports. Uh, final thing I would like to mention here that the system was built in a compliance with the European uh, shared information, environmental information systems principles, which are information is managed as close as possible to its, uh, its sources. And uh, information is co collected one time and shared with others for uh, many purposes. There is no need to double the work. Information is uh, readily available to public authority and enable them to easily fulfill their legal reporting obligation, whether it's a reporting obligation nationally or internationally. And the information is available for the public uh, with appropriate level of uh, aggregation. And of course, it is, uh, as said before, the, uh, easily accessible uh, to all users and the uh, public. Thank you. That concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, time. And uh, back to you, Ingara. Thank you, Rimini Majid. Uh, actually, the waste management is, it can follow all three medium, land, air, and water. So in terms of when we come to the waste management, a quantification of waste generated, and also it is very important to monitor the environment impact. So your system is doing exactly that, a very comprehensive system, which monitors, and also the stakeholders' involvement is very key for waste management. So it 100%. covers actually all the uh, key elements in waste management. Uh, this is correct, yes. Yeah, so the, 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 yeah, the, the, with that, uh, we will go to the last presentation of the session. Uh, which is from uh, Mr. Mohammed Ayu. Uh, he, he will be talking about how the innovative monitoring networks can give uh, to get clear understanding of the underlying causes of the application. So, um, Mr. Ayu, the floor is for you. Thank you, Ngarasan, and, and um, Salam Alaikum, everyone. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me well and uh, see the presentation. Good. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my uh, colleagues who are involved in, in the work that we do here. I'm the Senior Research Director of the Environment and Sustainability Center at the Qatar Environment and Energy Research Institute. We, we operate a number of programs across air quality and climate, um, environmental chemistry, microbiology, as well as uh, sustainability. Um, one of the areas that I want to highlight here is um, basically the challenges uh, that we face as a country in the state of Qatar um, in terms of uh, air quality. Um, what you're looking at here is an infographic that describes uh, the difference between what we observe in our measurement activities as well as um, uh, compared to what the world perceives uh, air quality is for, for the state of Qatar. Uh, if you look at um, some of the numbers uh, in, in, in brown there, uh, these are numbers obtained from the Global Burden of Disease, uh, which you know, is, is a global study that, that uses uh, internationally available data to um, understand uh, the health impacts on the population. And data from the state of Qatar attributes annual average PM 2.5 for Greater Doha in the 70s um, micrograms per cubic meter. While we operate a number of stations and, and, and our data is more in line with um, what is understood as, as the Middle East and North Africa average. And we see a, you know, a, a notable decrease in, in, in PM 2.5 concentrations over the past couple of years. Um, we attribute this, this, this change in perspective or this difference in perspective uh, to lack of data transparency um, on the part of the state of Qatar and, and peer reviewed studies when it comes to air quality. So that we see that as an opportunity for improvement here. 
Um, the second area of challenge, of course, is we are not, from an air quality perspective, where we want to be. And, and charting out a path to uh, where we want to go um, in comparison with regional standards. Um, you can see the lines here for EU standards and the WHO guideline. Um, how can research and development uh, inform uh, the path towards these um, clean air policies and, and then improving air quality in the state of Qatar? Uh, so, as I mentioned, we operate a network of six air quality monitoring stations across Greater Doha. This is an area that covers about 90 to 95 percent of the population of the country. Um, in addition to that, we, we, we have a multitude of, of data sources, um, including, you know, the regulatory um, uh, analyzers within the stations. We have research grade instrumentation that we rely on. We have a sensor based in instrumentation. We we are evaluating different sensor technologies in, in, in our harsh environment and looking at how they perform relative to um, our reference grade uh, analyzers and looking at developing calibration curves and so on to improve that data set. Um, we also uh, collect the, quite a bit of crowdsourced data, satellite data. And then, of course, a massive amount of metadata that we generate from, from our operations to look at emission sources from different activities, whether it's natural uh, versus anthropogenic, uh, looking at you know, emissions from industry, from traffic, uh, putting all of that together and understanding also how much of those emissions are, um, that emission profile are within our control. In other words, how much of that is generated nationally versus how much is, is, is due to transboundary transport. Um, using that information, of course, within the context of regional photochemical models, as well as um, uh, individual exposure models to understand uh, the implications on, on the health and productivity of the Qatari population, but also look at economic impacts, um, infrastructural impacts of, of air pollution in the country. Uh, also looking at impacts on, on renewable energy production. Um, so photovoltaic um, technology, of course, is being deployed quite widely in the region, uh, but we find that the region with humidity, high humidity, high um, aerosol loading dust, uh, high temperatures provides some challenging uh, conditions for, for renewables in the region. So how can we work on mitigating some of those challenges and improving the, the, the energy production from renewables? Also looking at integration of uh, electric vehicles, how do electric vehicles um, manage within this environment, these environmental conditions and what are the best operating parameters? Uh, so, you know, we generate millions of data points a year from all of these activities and it is a real challenge to manage this data and and not only just manage it but extract from it um, the value and the actionable data that's needed by policy and decision makers to, to, to develop these different intervention strategies um, we of course rely and and contribute to the Tasma digital value um, effort uh, but also look at you know uh, big data, um, artificial intelligence, and, and machine learning in terms of assisting us to analyze this data, forecast it, and visualize it, both, as I mentioned, to policy and decision makers, as well as uh, general public. Um, our approach is, is this three-tiered approach, uh, looking at um, understanding the human exposure pathway from uh, looking at you know, the individual, um, scaling up to the national scale, and then eventually, of course, at a regional scale. Um, but from an individual perspective, understanding the difference in air quality from the indoor environment to the outdoor environment, uh, characterizing and being able to better represent uh, how much time I as an individual or you spend in the indoor environment versus outdoor to, to build a model that, that, that more accurately um, estimates our exposure. Uh, developing technology um, and solutions to mitigate uh, the, the exposure in the indoor and, and ambient environment is, is, is also a big part of our strategy. Um, we have critical national partnerships with respect to deploying um, solutions for indoor air quality, managing indoor air quality, actively uh, managing uh, indoor air quality through uh, HVAC systems, understanding how indoor air quality develops relative to the ambient in systems that allow for air exchange, like you know, HVAC managed systems, but also in, in residential um, 
buildings that uh, don't necessarily have air exchange and, 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 and rely on split unit air conditioning. So how are different populations subjected to um, different types of uh, indoor and outdoor air pollution and how does that impact uh, the national health as well as the productivity of the population? And then moving to the national scale, looking at understanding the spatial and temporal variability uh, in ambient air quality, uh, working with national stakeholders and, 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 and the Ministry of Municipal and Environment in terms of technical oversight and management of air quality data to ensure that you have the highest quality data that you can use um, for action. Uh, of course, quantifying the health and economic burden is, is a critical part of it uh, that you know, helps you understand your liabilities, but it also um, helps present the opportunities for, for, for improvement. Uh, developing these, um, integrating all of these systems within um, an air quality management framework to develop both short and long-term intervention strategies that allow you to, to improve air quality and, 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 and decrease uh, that exposure burden. And then finally, the communication, um, understanding that uh, communicating with, with policy and decision makers is critical, but of course, also with the general public. Uh, public communication is a critical element of air quality management, uh, providing me or you with that information to, to, to make informed individual decisions as to what I want to do with my day or understand my level of exposure is critical in terms of allowing me and my family and yours uh, to reduce their exposure. But then finally, also understanding that, you know, we, we, you know, we do not live in a vacuum. Uh, we, you know, uh, there are regional elements associated with uh, air pollution and, and the transboundary transport of pollution and looking to articulate the need for a regional clean air agreement, um, utilizing some of the platforms uh, that have um, been mentioned earlier on in the day uh, and, and, and using that information to, to um, extrapolate this at a more, more of a regional level. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mohammed. It's, it's really interesting to see that how you apply the digital technology at the, at the national level. Air quality is really a complicated issue with the different areas. And you are trying to apply it at the, at the individual level, at the national level, and also use it to cooperate uh, regionally. We, we used to say actually for air quality, we had to think globally, we had to coordinate regionally, we had to act locally. So because this absolutely. is a global issue. Yeah, so absolutely. And, and, and digital transformation, of course, plays an integral part of all of this. Exactly, uh, exactly. Know, just as I mentioned yeah. before, managing our own data that we generate here is, is, is a massive task and make Ensure that you, yeah. you get the benefits of the individual projects and, 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 and look at um, cross or co-benefits associated with putting all of this data together with, with, with um, epidemiological studies and, 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 and economic impact assessments. So it's very important. So uh, thank you very much for all the speakers. Now we have uh, in the question and answer session. So we have some questions. Uh, Maybe I can, uh, we can take, because of the time limit, I think we have parts of time limit, but uh, we will take a few questions. Um, one of them is, uh, how can resources be used to achieve sustainable development? How does society implement a specific system for the reduction of environmentally harmful waste? Maybe Farah or Engineer Majid, who made presentation on the waste management and circular economy. The, waste, the question is how can resources be used to achieve sustainable development and how to implement in a particular uh, system, the society? Uh, uh, if you allow me, Farah. Yeah, please. Uh, in this regard, I would think about the, the waste information system as a tool to look uh, on all the available resources and make sure it is uh, utilized uh, fully to its uh, maximum uh, performance. For example, in the system I have just shown that there is a, we can track exactly the efficiency of uh, trucks transferring the waste. 
So if the truck is, uh, is transferring daily half of its design capacity, this is a waste of uh, resources of the truck, of the driver, of the salaries, of the, of the capital cost of the truck itself, and of course, of, of time. So we can easily identify the low efficiency uh, factors in this process, uh, and then study it and apply like correction um, measures to make sure that all the available resources are used uh, uh, efficiently. And I think this is one thing. Another thing maybe to, to achieve the sustainable development um, uh, uh, from the indicators I have mentioned, the system collect the data from all the resources I have just uh, said and explained. Most of the uh, indicators are related to the sustainable development goals. So this will keep a great um, eye and will give us a tool of uh, visualization of where we are now and uh, how we are moving yearly from these goals. Uh, this is um, an answer from my side. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's really uh, good. Um, if I might the just rest. add. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think uh, that was an excellent answer. Um, data and data availability is really the way that we're going to transform. And without that, we, we're we blind, we're working blind. Um, and I think uh, in the presentation, I highlighted that it's really about that circular economy. And I think your question is excellent because it shows that it's not just about the waste, it's about the resources upstream. How do we make sure we use them effectively, efficiently? And it's about having a sustainable system, a circular economy, as opposed to just looking at the resources separately and the waste separately. We really need to look at that whole life cycle and make sure that at each stage, we are making informed decisions, as uh, Majid said, really data-driven informed decisions and moving towards uh, sustainable action, sustainable practices. And um, uh, that I think will help us achieve um, our sustainable development goal. Thank you. Uh, other question is, uh, I think this could be answered by the air quality crew. Uh, this region in West Asia, we have environmental challenges that's different from the other region, like dust storm and the climatic condition. So in this environment challenges, uh, how can we really uh, achieve the digital transformation? Maybe the question is uh, in general, but maybe you can put it in the context of air quality. So how can we achieve digital transformation in air quality, given the uh, environment challenges in, in West Asia? Maybe we can start with Jan, then go to Muhammad. Yes, uh, so let me take that uh, also that question first. So uh, I think to act, uh, to achieve this uh, digital transformation, we need to have that data available. So I believe governments around the west of Asia need to make that data first available, real time available. I think uh, our colleague Mohammed Ayub just mentioned that uh, not always that data is actually published. So I think uh, for the region to actually have to see and uptake into making use of that data, that needs to be first step needs to come from governments to make that public and eventually involve also uh, the rest of the society to contribute through different means by just making, creating that awareness, you know, schools, through educational programs, uh, as well as also just through like just citizens, uh, scientists, which can just put their centers and like uh, share their data to the rest of the world to create this uh, awareness. So uh, I think that's quite a few things that needs to fit to be able to achieve that uh, digital transformation. But as long as the data is available, people will do crazy stuff out of this. You know, they will uh, make use of that. They will integrate it in systems. And that's when this is going to happen. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I agree. Mohammed? Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I, I, I completely concur with my colleagues. Um, uh, answer it's you know because I think it's because of the challenging harsh environmental conditions and and and, and uh, really unique conditions that we experience here that the reliance on digital transformation is even more important. Um, you know, getting more people to, to to take a look at this data and, and and do different things with it and extract additional levels of value from it is absolutely critical in terms of. Uh, solving some of these problems. And at the heart of all of that is the question of data transparency. As a region, we need to become more transparent with our environmental parameters and 
and, and understand that, that, that the utility of these environmental parameters is when they are put in the public domain and, and made available for use across uh, political boundaries and, 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 and across different applications. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it, it's true. Now, when, when we come to West Asia, like the climatic condition, and we cannot put up a lot of monitoring station, and the satellite technology really give us the opportunity to get some kind of mapping and linking that with the ground level monitoring and using that artificial intelligence in between will be really uh, useful to generate the data for the region. Uh, because we don't have a lot of data in the region on, on air quality. So if you look at the telecommunication, before the mobile, there were some countries, they had the lowest per capita mobile line, and not mobile line, telephone line, before the mobile was there. Now, those countries have one of the highest per capita use of uh, mobile phone. So they don't have to actually wait. So they just leap off into the next stage. So I think the, the West Asia is in a good position, although currently we have a lot of data gaps and the digital transformation can really help us to leap off into the next level using the digital transformation to get our data, not only in the air quality, but also in the waste management and, and all the pollution field. So it's up to us how we are going to actually harness, uh, how we are going to make use of this. And also it will help, help us to harmonize the system, the digital transformation, because we cannot compare apples and oranges. So the, the region need to have uh, similar units and similar method of measurement for, for the data generation and also using the global standard. So the digital technology can really, really help us uh, towards that one. So with that, I, I think we come to the end of our session uh, today. So I really like to thank all the, the four presenters, very, very insightful and really good to know that the, uh, we have started actually using the digital transformation. We only move forward, so we started the process. And thank you for all the participants also for listening to us. Uh, so with this, maybe I will end this session and give the floor back to the organizers for thank you, announcement. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you very much for uh, the great session. Uh, we really enjoyed it. Uh, we learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much for Thank the you. great contribution. So, uh, colleagues, uh, with that, uh, we are concluding the first day of the conference now. And uh, allow me to summarize maybe uh, the highlights of the day. Uh, in three messages. Um, of course, we will develop a very detailed report about all the interventions and the discussions, but uh, on the higher level, we have uh, gathered three key messages from the first day. Number one, we have seen commitment from governments, uh, intervention on the ground uh, from uh, different organization, on how digital transformation can scale uh, these initiatives. So I think this is number one. Number two, we saw also um, innovation happening in Abu Dhabi uh, with the relation to soil quality monitoring. Uh, also uh, colleagues from Qatar, they presented the monitoring air quality and highlighted the uh, data sharing. Uh, we also saw um, uh, some uh, great initiative related to waste management uh, from Jordan and Oman, uh, which are doing, uh, you know, to help to, to move towards circular economy. The third uh, message also, we, we saw a fundamental role for uh, collaboration between uh, different actors. 
uh, I think uh, we have a lot of knowledge, uh, you know, in, in the region that we really can uh, make uh, use of it and scale it up to, to, to the highest level. The Digital Transformation Task Force also uh, provided uh, elaborate uh, avenue to make this collaboration, uh, collaboration happening. So we are uh, really uh, looking forward to, to convene uh, a platform to, for, for future collaboration between different uh, entities. So this is the end of uh, the first day. We would like to invite you once again for tomorrow's conference using the same conference ID and password. Uh, again, thank you uh, very much for uh, your engagement and uh, hope to see you tomorrow again. Thank you. Masalama. <laughs>